some of the pages you may have on. <coughs> Call the meeting to order. Welcome to the Reports of the Planning Board, August 18th, 2022. Uh, we have two members who are not present with us this evening, Mr. Bahana and Mr. Clark. So Mr. DiRienzo will be sitting for Mr. Clark. Mr. Simonis will be sitting for Mr. Bahana. Um, first item on the agenda, we have uh, the board discussion of regulatory amendments and a master plan. This is a, a new placeholder for just board comments. I'd like to keep this, if we can, to less than 30 minutes. But I know some board members have expressed desire to talk about um, what the board might need to do for to address zoning, the master plan, and perhaps the planning board rules. Um, planning director, by the way, is seeking funding for to work on the master plan for next year, and she's hopeful about that. So who would like to speak up? Jane. I'll start. Um, I actually reviewed the master plan. Come up to your mi yeah. microphone. Thank you. Hello? Okay. I actually re reviewed the master plan in some depth, and um, I'd just like to make a couple of comments that I think all point to the need for some specific uh, revisioned areas of the master plan. I have my own ideas about what those could be, so I'm just offering my own opinion here. Um, the plan assumed a stagnant population growth and I think continued trends in, a, in, a, um, in, in its diversity chapter, which really talks about the diversity of art, theater, and startup businesses. Um, and those assumptions haven't necessarily, um, they're, not, they're not current, I don't think. I mean, we haven't seen development in those areas. We've seen a lot of development in hotels, restaurants, et cetera tourism um, and the master plans only themes to really guide growth um, in the next decade um, because it didn't use conventional categories like for example land use housing economic development which it states right up front um, it it really doesn't provide um, any kind of vision about population growth. It excludes standards for density, development, infill, and rate of growth. And I think all of those really need to be addressed. Um, instead, it seems to emphasize when I read it, um, the need for more open spaces, the need for public access, particularly to the waterfront, which is the opposite of density, you know, further development and infill. Um, it consistently emphasizes the need for a walkable uh, and human scale to this town. And so I think we really need to start codifying what we collectively mean, particularly what the general public really wants in terms of um, these objectives, um, what it means to be building at a human scale, which is mentioned over and over. Um, um, on page 106 of the master plan, there was a recent development um, near the downtown, which uh, resulted in significant massing and scale, and it specifically mentions concerns about the impact of that on the historical character of the town. So again, I mean, the only thing I could find around neighborhood character and scale and density and infill are actual, actually just a comment here and a comment there about the residents' wishes to um, have compatibility with the current human scale in town. I don't feel we are necessarily now growing in this manner. And I think we, we really need um, some standards um, specifically around what we mean by an extent of density, what, what people, what, what the general public thinks about that, what's the intended future rate of growth, since we can do nothing about the rate of growth to date, um, and what we mean by higher value uses with land. Um, 
that's kind of point number one, like a whole point about density, infill, development, and rate of growth. My second point, and I'm just going to leave it for here because I know we need more in-depth conversations about all of this, but just to kind of open up what I feel is a compelling need for looking at these areas within the master plan and making them more specific, I'd like to point out that over and over the master plan talks about the need to plan for an aging population and how that needs to become a major focus of the city and public agencies in the coming decade. And though we talk a lot about affordable housing, I think affordable housing is distinct from, you know, senior housing. You can have an affordable, ho affordable housing that requires you to walk four flights up. That's not senior housing. And, and senior housing in and of itself in this city seems to also, like, the need for it is across an entirely large socioeconomic continuum. So it's not just affordable housing the way workforce and affordable housing have been defined. So I just point out that those two areas in particular need further discussion, public input, and and specification in a revised master plan, and, and I'd like to, us to do that as a board. I don't know if that means, you know, setting up an advisory committee or if it means asking the planning director for a timeline and work plan, but I would like something concrete to come out of this, so I welcome any suggestions about how that could be characterized. Thank you very much. I think that's, uh, to summarize, obviously you're looking for a master plan update and you have some very specific ideas about it, so thank you for that and we're, we're going to proceed with that. Who would like to also comment, if anyone? Andrew? Yeah, only because it directly dovetails off of Jane's points. Um, I think in large part we've done, the city as a, as a whole has done a really nice job incorporating more sidewalks, i.e. Islington. Street, Maplewood Ave, they've all gotten really beautiful new sidewalks done and that's going to continue to happen and anytime you can see that type of growth done by the city without too much private investment contributing, um, I think that's a really good awareness and so that's going to continue bringing that human scale that you mentioned, Jane, into that. Um, but outside of the ur urban core in some of these downtown areas, we can't neglect to think about the gateway zone and why they were established. So considering the Route 1 corridor and some of the projects we've approved there, um, we have to focus on not isolating those to just those development sites. So take the one behind Five Guys on Peverly Hill, as well as some of those other single family neighborhoods that have come to fruition. Um, we had to bring purpose to those outside areas and whether it be sidewalks or multimodal paths, um, we can't neglect those areas. And I think it even continues further down towards Maple Haven and, and across Route 1. So, whether it's rearranging our modes of transportation with a city uh, purpose or private users and kind of saying, hey, we're building all these sidewalks and whatnot so that we don't have to rely so much on cars and, and vehicles. So generally vehicles, whether it's buses, cars, et cetera, um, we need to kind of bring that to, to the priority so that in the future when we're approving parking considerations and looking at parking allowances, we can say, well, we have the ability to, to not have so much parking because we have these paths, because we have this accessibility, and that spans just beyond the downtown. So I think that's kind of the focal point. And the last part is that, you know, we're gonna start to think about um, the community campus development and um, relocating the alternative school. So those are areas that have a great amenity to Portsmouth and rearranging the focus towards those is, is should be considered in this master plan, although it wasn't previously. Um, and, and I think that's probably something we can start to incorporate as like an addendum or an additional project in the future. Thank you. Any, yes, Jim. Yes, um, I was reviewing the master plan also, and I noticed on that it was either page 30 or 31 that um, based on the website survey that was done in 2015 or 16, the number one job that Portsmouth citizens want us to do is to make sure we have an adequate water supply. That was their number one issue that they, uh, they rated on that survey. So I'm hoping that the master plan update will include a uh, water resources 
master plan update because in the in the state of New Hampshire's uh, planning board handbook on section two page four they they mentioned that uh, a water resources plan should be done concurrently or at mm -hmm. the same time frame as a uh, as the master plan itself so that's my issue for the master plan thank you good thought anybody else sure here to add on to to what Andrew was saying and Jane um, the number two issue in the master plan raised by uh, residents was parking and um, I think we need to have a discussion about parking especially surrounding the down in the downtown and s neighborhoods surrounding the downtown area residents are uh, I think struggling especially in the neighborhoods just off of downtown um, there's a lot of we need to have a conversation and uh, it's it's obviously a, a concern and it's affecting residents significantly and there's also if you compare other cities in the state a um, a difference into requirements for new construction and new developments in the downtown area related to parking that is a lower standard in Portsmouth that it's higher in other other towns and I think we saw with the uh, West End Yards development coming back for parking an issue that they recognized and kind of um, we're considering because of, of, of a loss of parking there and that's not even in the downtown area yes and so that's a regulatory issue and it ties in a little bit with what Andrew was saying because the disconnected areas are different than the downtown area and so there probably ought to be different parking standards and this is a topic we can talk about and should talk about in more detail um, anybody else is, it, is this the time to bring up other issues not related to the master plan any other regulatory or um, just process I yeah you've got a few more minutes okay sure. um, I just noticed the this meetings packet was the packet that we use and the public uses to review our job here was 2,000 pages in one PDF and I don't know about the rest of you but I can't skim through 2,000 pages very easily and find what I need and then I then it was reduced to a thousand pages I guess there was a glitch so that was a good improvement it was cut in half but I was hoping is there a way that the planning department can just separate the architectural drawings and the site drawings in one packet and then everything else in something else so have an appendices and then just the the stuff that we concentrate the most on yes we've talked about this a little bit and I think the applicants could do this they could assemble things some of them are already doing that in a little bit in terms of appendices but then the packets get assembled with everything together so you've got the meat of the project that you're talking about then the appendices and drainage analyses for one thing can take hundreds of pages and traffic printouts can take hundreds of pages so I think it's good to have those but probably at the end of the packet um, we can work on that I think that's that's an easy <coughs> that's an easy fix so do you foresee two packets I mean again I'm trying to have them separate so I can just click on one and get the good stuff click on the other and have all the reference weeds so to speak it would be yeah it would probably be easier to have it in two just for download purposes but they'd be together because the information does need to be be together because one references the other um, Mr. chairman can I just ask yes. um, uh, Planning Board Member Hewitt, are you having trouble with the bookmarks? Because if you click into the bookmark, it has each plan set within the bookmark. So you click plan set, and then they're also laid out within the bookmark by typically by which plan set you're looking for, like site plan. And so has that have the bookmarks? Because I think Stephanie takes a great deal of time to bookmark the entire packet, and so. If, is that not been working very well well even with the bookmarks some some submissions can be four or five hundred pages mm -hmm. and I just I just don't feel the need to skim through all that stuff I don't understand why it just can't be separated since majority of us don't even look at that information I don't mean I just feel we should concentrate on the things we make decisions on mm -hmm. so it's, it, I think it's more I, I mean I pull I pull the material out that you're talking about myself and have to I have the 
the full packet, and then I have the plan sets and the other information pulled out as a small. Just in the course of a meeting, it's quicker to scroll through. That's that's all. And the bookmarks are very helpful. Mm -hmm. So, and anyone else? On the website too, they are organized by agenda item. If that's just the, they're, the, yes. the community is not getting the thousand pages they're getting, they go to the website and they can see things organized by. If that's if that's helpful also. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that is. Can I say one thing? Uh, yes. Just so you know, on your iPads, you can actually go to the city website and pull up each individual and save them as separate projects in your iPad if you want to as well. Right. I've done that sometimes. Do that with my my computer. Mm -hmm. One more related okay. item. Um, I noticed this week that West End Yards is starting construction on their additional parking. They needed a hundred more spaces. I think we're all aware of that. What happened February or March? And I was just wondering, have they submitted the parking study that we asked for? The planning board asked for. So, as I recall, we asked that they they said that they had done a sort of a brief study to determine that they needed more parking we asked that that be submitted I have not seen that but I can certainly follow up with them about that mm -hmm. you, oh, so you don't know if it's been done yet it was already done at the time of the meeting you may recall this was the basis for them asking saying that we in doing in review of our internal parking practices and what we're observing and we've done some study that we think we need you know more at this time and then I believe the planning board said would you mind sharing that with us they said they would not and then but I don't think we did receive it so I can absolutely follow up on that but I think we voted for very specifics we wanted the size of the apartment number of bedrooms occupants and how many cars that's what I think we were looking for I can I can go back and look at that stipulation Okay, thanks. Anything else? I have one thing that relates to our next item. Uh, we currently operate in theory by the planning board rules, which reference Robert's rules. And I know Greg, Mahana, and myself are probably the only two who have an actual copy of Robert's rules. And it's, uh, it's a very useful document, but it may be a little bit more than what we need for this board, and it could become burdensome. And some of the other things, like I'm about to talk about a public hearing where we might want some flexibility for public input. And um, I think we should just go through the rules and see if you think they're working. Does the chair have too much authority, not enough authority? Uh, should meetings be run a little bit differently? Those are the planning board rules. That's what the rules are about. So I'd, I'd just like to have a session where we talk about it and uh, we can do that. So. Just to be clear, you, you'd like a session on, on the eight-page planning board rules that we yes. operate under? Okay. Yeah, I was noticing those myself, and um, I think our rules regarding tie votes are not complicit with state or guidance that... Uh, I agree with you. They're wrong. Okay. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Jane. Um, the, other th the other thing is uh, we could do this next meeting if it's, you know, easier, um, but the email that we got at 237 this afternoon um, that gives the two completely opposite decisions regarding the Rains Avenue um, issue um, I, I, I'm going to need to understand what I looked through it and I don't really understand particularly how 24 hours later the decision was turned over. So could we have some, maybe our city lawyer or somebody, um, walk us through how those decisions were made and what they really mean? You can ask for that. Our, our new city attorney, Susan Morrill, is in the, in the room tonight. I'm not going to call on her right now for mm -hmm. that. Uh, but that, that's her in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like Mr. Sullivan wishes to speak. Come on, gotta make him speak as much as possible before he retires. <laughs> you have 23 seconds, Mr. Sullivan. <laughs> I, uh, I, I did not participate in the decision that was discussed, but I'm happy to answer any questions about the decision-making process generally or specifically to the extent that I know. So. <sighs> Would, would you mind restating the question? 
Um, well, I don't have the. I don't have the email in front of me, but basically it had two attachments. One attachment, I believe from the House of Appeals, I'm not 100% positive about what I'm saying, um, said that the city's position was granted regarding, um, this had to do with the ZBA um, and the planning board deciding to revisit. The two motions to dismiss that were in the spirit, yeah, the, uh, they were in separate cases. The different uh, properties. Okay. Which is why they are different answers. Okay, I cases. didn't get that. So could you just say which one is the Rains one and which one is the Green Street one? What, what happened? The, uh, the Green Street one is the one which has not been dismissed. The Rains Avenue is the one that was dismissed, and the Superior Court has basically said that case should come back to the zoning board. And the essential theory was that uh, parties are required to satisfy all of their local administrative procedures before they go into court. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was determined in that case that the uh, procedures, local procedures, were not completed and satisfied. Bob, if, so I could, if I could add to that, these decisions both came down earlier this month, and um, uh, the, basically recall that the, the planning board made a decision to rehear one rains, and that was challenged immediately, and the city made a motion to dismiss that challenge. That motion was not accepted by the courts. That challenge stands and will be tested in the courts. On the other one, the board of adjustment. This one is confusing. <laughs> The board voted to rehear, and then the applicant asked the courts to the, ask the board of adjustment to reconsider that decision to rehear. And I believe there was some kind of tie vote, Bob. You remember, I think, and then that went to the court. And we also, in that case, I believe, yes. asked for a dismissal, and it was not. And it's been sent back as that Bob. It was a matter of substantive law that the court could decide. Mm -hmm. Have, have those opinions been provided to you? Should we send them to the individual board members? Yes. They were this afternoon. Right, at 2.30, and they're very dense, and they're very legalese, yes. But I do have copies of them. So particularly with the Rains Avenue property, what does that mean? Does, does it mean they're free to start building? Does it mean that it's going to another no, court? Nobody is free to start building anything on so, either of these. So what is the status there with regards to, like, where is that case? I, I, I don't understand in it, the case, even I In the case it. in which the motion to dismiss was granted, the, the matter is coming back to the zoning board. That's not it's Rains. Rains and On Rains. 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 I'm, I'm asking about Rains. Green is coming back to the zoning board. If I could make a suggestion, anybody who has specific questions about that, take it up with Attorney Sullivan. Yeah, I just in one in one sentence. The other case is continuing in the judicial process in court. Oh, I see. That's right. But Rains nobody is, is free over. to do anything. Okay. Until he... Check with me, and I'll, I'll direct you to whichever attorney is on, on deck. Okay. 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 Maybe I'm the only person who didn't completely understand those dense court findings, but no. I certainly will have another meeting with somebody here to understand them. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't either. I didn't. I actually didn't read them because all the other stuff I had to go through today. So, thank you for reading them. <laughs> we have a public hearing that's been continued from June 23rd on the zoning and the way this meeting will work tonight there will be a presentation a brief presentation from staff and then we have uh, public comment now because it's a public hearing we, our rules have a three-step process that have uh, three rounds of talk potentially first three minutes with oral comment only second up to ten minutes that include can include a presentation and a third round of ten minutes that's also oral comment uh, I would entertain a suggestion since we've already had a fair amount of discussion about this to allow two rounds of discussion, three minutes and five minutes with no limit. Anybody wants to use whatever they want to use or anything else the board might feel comfortable with, or we can just proceed with the normal three rounds. I just want to offer it as an idea before we get started. Say but I can't make a motion. Say again what you're proposing. I'm proposing that we allow 
two rounds, a three round and a five, three minute round and a five minute round with no limit if somebody wants to present something, which they're not supposed to do in the first three minutes normally. Right, because it usually is three minutes, 10 minutes unlimited. So you want to do three minutes, five minutes. It's three, ten, ten actually in the rules, not unlimited. Oh. I want to do three and five as, as an idea. If, if there's something that comes up, we can revisit it again, but. Sure, I'll make a motion that we change the public comment for three, first round, three minutes, second round, five minutes. Second. This is a suspension of the rules. It requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Cracknell, would you like to present? Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Board. For the record, Nick Cracknell, the Principal Planner in the Planning Department. I think in the interest of time, unless you prefer, uh, I'd like to focus on where, where we sort of left off at the work session last week and the feedback that we received both from board members and members of the public and offer some suggestions, uh, most of which you've seen in the packet coming into this meeting as a response to those comments. So if we go to the next slide, uh, just as a recap, this is a code cleanup. It's the first of, of uh, at least three known parts at the Land Use Committee. And we're focused on the building height standards and there are four subparts to what was presented uh, both in the material and at length on the uh, work session on August 8th. So we've got the building height uh, map changes. Um, we have corner and, and through lots. Uh, where we're wordsmithing the language there to remove some apparent ambiguity on how, how a corner lot factors into multiple building heights that might be on more than one side of the property. Uh, part three is uh, the concept of adding building heights to the civic districts and applying the CD4 dimensional standards. Uh, and the fourth one was a series of definitional modifications or new definitions being added, again, all relating to how building height is measured. So we'll go to the next slide. So I think there were five main areas of interest or concern, depending on the speaker uh, that provided the input. Uh, and I haven't prioritized them, but I just want to bump through these five and give a response to each of them. And we discussed some of this at the, the meeting on the 8th, but there were a number of people that suggested uh, we shouldn't be trying to increase any building heights in the downtown. And the response given last Monday uh, and is presented in the material is we're not increasing the heights with the exception of one property on Haven Court and High Street that would go up five feet everything's likely to actually go down a little bit because of how height will be measured. Right now, height is measured on the finished grade. What we're uh, proposing to do here in the definition section is create a definition for averaged existing grade and average finished grade, and whichever is lower will become the low reference point to measure the height of a building. So just about everybody, unless they're on a completely flat site, will have slightly less uh, allowable height as a result of the definitional change. The second item on there was the, uh, actually we'll go through the slides because I want to reiterate the uh, High Street Haven Court exception to what I just said. So right now on High Street, we go to the next slide, you'll see the image. Uh, uh, there was an image. Are we in the PowerPoint? Anyway, yeah, the image is there. There it is. Okay, so the arrows are pointed at that parking lot uh, that was behind Rudy's on High Street and Haven Court. Everything that you, that you see on that map, with the exception, oh, is that me moving it? Okay, sorry about that. So the, this is the proposed change, just, whoops. We good? So just here. This is currently a green line, and a green line is limited to 40 feet in height. Two to three stories, 40 feet in height. This would increase it by five feet. And you'll notice that all the other surrounding properties are already orange. And again, it, it's 40 feet going to 45. Uh, if the proposed definitions change as a part of this uh, zoning amendment, it'll actually be lower than 45 because you're not going to be able to fill uh, any of the portions of that building facade and take advantage of, of a filled condition. Uh, 
Um, so it's a five foot increase and it's really about smoothing out the lines. If there was ever an error here made, it was back in 2013 when we made it green. It should have been orange. Everything's orange. These, this building is 45 at least feet uh, along the garage on, on uh, Ladd Street. This is almost 46 feet over here on the other side of High Street. It's 45 and a half feet up here. These building heights that were designated back in 2013, they aren't perfect, but we were, we were focused primarily on the existing built environment. So obviously there was nothing in that parking lot. And I think we just went up Fleet Street, uh, up Haven Court, which is really a back service alley with very limited access and carried the green line around the parking lot. But we are not talking about a very significant uh, amendment here to that property to tie it into the, uh, the rest of High Street. So, we'll go, so there's no, no change as a response to that comment, at least uh, from last, last Monday. We go to the next issue. Um, there was discussion from, I think, a couple of members as well as somebody from the public about Foundry Place and, and Hill Street and lowering the building heights from what's being proposed on both those streets. Hill Street is not included in the amendments here to be either increased or lowered. We're actually not looking at Hill Street in this set of amendments. That's not to say Hill Street, Hanover, and that entire neighborhood doesn't need to be revisited. It's just not part of a code cleanup. The code cleanup here is focused on the fact that Foundry Place didn't exist in 2013, so we couldn't apply building heights to it in 2013. It's a road that exists in the city. It should have heights on both sides, and the heights that we're proposing uh, maintain the status quo of what the heights are already, either on the built parking garage that's zoned municipal today at 60 feet or all of the DSA properties on both sides of Foundry Place. They're already 60 feet, so we're not changing that. W with the incentive, they're 50 feet with the 10-foot uh, addition with the overlay district. Heinemann right now is a green line. Maybe we can go to the next image. I, I think I might, yeah. So, should have done that first. Where is it? Oops. So there's the parking garage. I think it's actually about 62 feet. This is a brown line that's proposed here, which is a 50-foot district, and you can get the extra 10 feet because this entire neighborhood right here is in the overlay district for now. We're not proposing to change that. Again, this is code cleanup, not master planning or generating a new specific plan for this neighborhood. This lot here is lot three, and it's already been approved for a, a five-story hotel. This lot over here has been approved for a, a five-story or four-story with a penthouse um, mixed-use building. This is Ferguson here, the, the kitchen place. That is currently zoned at 50 feet. And they're getting their heights, the lot three, Ferguson, and uh, those two are off Ridge Street and Deer Street right here because we had no foundry place back in 2013. Uh, and actually this zoning was adopted in 2014 after the downtown. So it was a year later. We did the vision plan for the north end and then developed a code, brought it forward. So we are not proposing to change any of the development rights associated with any of the properties here. And there was discussion last week about, hey, well, what about lot two that Rogers owns? It, it, right now it has no building height, and that is true. But if the city uh, didn't get that for the park that it was approved to be uh, constructed as, then the owners uh, of lot three would merge it in and have a 50-foot building using the, the, the zoning height down here. This is already a brown line on the existing map, which makes this 50 feet. This is 50 feet from Hill Street right back here, because again, Foundry Place didn't exist. So all we're doing again is strapping on either what's been approved or what's been built along Foundry Place. And if you look at Heinemann here, Heinemann gets its building height currently down here on Hanover Street, and it has a green line, it's 40 feet. So that entire property is already three, up to three stories and 40 feet. So we're suggesting on the bottom, uh, we uh, maintain that 40-foot maximum height. And then Peter Hapney is down here at 66 Rock Street. He actually has no building height. He was orphaned down here. We didn't realize that till recently. So we're proposing around that cul-de-sac with the artwork in the middle, that that be a green line consistent with Heinemann and the transition into that residential neighborhood, that it only be 40 feet here. So that's the proposal. There's no... Um, alterations that we've suggested from last Monday to tonight in respect to Hill Street or 
uh, some suggestions of this line being lower uh, in order to maybe bring people back to the table here uh, from a planning perspective. Again, we're supportive of revisiting all of this, but it really needs to be done as part of a separate effort, not a code cleanup. Uh, if the vision plan's in question from 2015, then we need another uh, public process to evaluate that plan itself and make changes if, if folks want to make them at that time. Okay, yep. Can I just ask one question before you move on, which is at the head of foundries of the street there. Up here? Yeah, but those properties got their fifth story yes. by getting by giving the city community space, correct. is that correct? Correct, right here, lot two actually is proposed to be a park and both lot three and lot six used about a third of this land area to create the additional story. So that's that's what's a little confusing about then setting it at the height that they gained by getting by using the incentives. See what I'm saying? We're actually setting this at 50 and the buildings that are approved are at 60. 60, okay. Yeah, so we've act, you know the whole idea here in the code was the vision plan in 2013 always envisioned 60 foot buildings here, but we were trying to figure out how can we get something out of it you know, for the city without having to buy the land. So we lowered it 10 feet and then gave it back, but you had to give the city something to get it and it was voluntary. That's really helpful, thank yeah. you. Uh, okay, we'll go to the next issue, three of five. Uh, there was a suggestion from, I think, somebody in the public and it was supported by someone on the board that, hey, if, if we've got cemetery properties that are within the uh, building height map, doesn't it make sense that we lower the height from what was proposed? I think it was a yellow line, 30, 35 feet, to the smallest, shortest um, designation, which is one story or 20 feet. And right now we only have one property in the entire character-based zoning area that is one story or 20 feet, and it's a little piece right next to the bridge uh, on Maplewood as you go over towards Dennett Street. Nothing's being built there. It's right on the shoreline. It's in the buffer, but in the vision plan, we envision maybe a building going back where it used to be. There were three buildings along that bridge uh, 150 years ago, so the idea was maybe one could go that's water dependent. Uh, anyway, it's not going there. It's not in the Rains Ave project, but that's the only other property in the character district uh, area that's one story or 20 feet. Normally, one story buildings are not conducive to an urban environment. So we are proposing, if you go to the next slide, we are proposing here for Union Cemetery, which is here on Maplewood Ave, and North Cemetery here. And there's about a 1,300 square foot parcel here that uh, used to be, I guess, quite a long time ago, a little fire station. Um, I have no idea what was in there, but it is owned by the city. Uh, these are all municipal properties in the municipal district. So that's the one story, 20 foot, line that sort of teal color so that that's an amendment from last monday as a result of the feedback on um, the eighth so we'll go to the fourth uh, issue at least on my list there was a discussion at the end of the meeting about hey what happened to the rooftop railings this was presented in the previous meeting back in july i had an amendment in there that spoke to rooftop appurtenances and relaxing the setback requirements for the railings and there was some discussion about that in July. It, it fell off my, uh, my list coming in here on the 8th and somebody, a board member, brought it to my attention. It's a good amendment. It allows uh, much more interest on the tops of these buildings to not require, most, most rail systems are 36 to 42, even 48 inches in height. So a think of a railing on a roof for a roof deck for a recessed penthouse or, or just a roof deck itself. It's currently a requirement that that railing be set back twice the height of the railing. So if it's a four foot railing, it has to be eight feet back. In the character districts, it actually forces it to 10 feet. So the amendment that we're uh, proposing here, and we, we brought this up in July, if you go to the next slide, the actual text is here, is to uh, exempt decorative railings no taller than four feet in height. They can be in that 10 foot area. So if you think of the 100 Club, um, on 100 Market Street. That railing is right on the edge of the building with the recessed penthouse. You think of the penthouse on Bow Street in the old brewery. That has a hip top penthouse with a railing system along the edge. Both of those predate the existing zoning, but those are things that uh, the HDC has repeatedly 
uh, wanted to be able to allow. It doesn't mean they're going to go there. It still has to get HDC approval if it's in the historic <coughs> district, but they wouldn't need zoning relief to have the railing out along the edge of the roof. That's 100 Market Street down there for anybody that that, that penthouse there has a railing system right on the perimeter wall. It's decorative. Yeah. I think it adds a lot of character to the building, mm -hmm. uh, relatively simple building otherwise. This is the one over on Bow Street. That railing is, is only set back about a foot from the edge uh, of that penthouse. And this, this is actually on the AC Hotel with the clear glass railing. So this will just make sure uh, those things can happen, at least in the character districts. So I think we got one more on my list. Um, there was discussion from both uh, members of the board and the public about considering removal of the civic districts, uh, either one property or all of the properties. We have nine, nine properties in the civic districts today. Um, so there was some suggestion that uh, we should remove that from the building height map, leave it the way it is, and not reference the CD4 dimensional standards. And I've got a map here that would show what that would look like. Um, if we can just go back, sorry, Steph. Uh, the main justification for you know, either tabling this or not moving forward with this particular element uh, tonight or back at the City Council would be to give us an opportunity to develop more detailed, uh, more refined standards than just the CD4, uh, which is really a borrow here. The civic districts today have no maximum building height uh, regulations. So they can build as tall as they want. HDC has to approve it, but there's no maximum uh, building height in the civic districts, and there are no dimensional controls for where you put a building or how big it is. So knowing um, the risk is low, but there are no guardrails, the idea here was to use a very sort of generous uh, set of dimensional standards for civic properties, that being the CD4. Uh, but I think it's a fair point that it probably makes sense, given the diversity between John Paul Jones, Langdon, um, the, the churches in the North Church and the South Church, very different pattern, uh, very different land use, that we take another pass at that. So, again, this was referenced in the memo last Monday when we had the work session that we would potentially pull this out and take another pass at it. So I've shown the map in the next slide. Uh, those are the nine properties uh, that I think most of you are familiar with. At the top, the Moffat Lad, the St. Saint, Saint John's, the Warner House, uh, the Synagogue, Langdon, South Church, North Church, Baptist Church, and John Paul Jones. Th those are your nine um, civic districts. So if we shut them off in the building height map, I think the next slide, would show them all removed from the proposed changes. So those arrows are still pointed at the same place. Now there's no building height around each of those properties. And then the next slide would show you what the new uh, uh, building height map would look like. And you would have gaps where those nine properties are, but at least the municipal properties would close a lot of the gaps that are in the existing map. So um, I think that's a summary of at least what, what I got out of the last meeting. Uh, listening to you and members of the public. Is, is there another slide, Steph, or at the end? Yep. So I'll stop there. I have every everything that I presented at the last meeting, if anybody has any questions or wants to look at it. But it was pretty extensive. I think I was here for about 40 minutes presenting, uh, so I didn't want to go back through it. I'm going to start off saying I, I support the idea of pulling the Civic out and out of the height in both for the height standards and also the CD4 made a lot of sense, is sort of a first pass, but I agree, I think it needs a little more study before um, a new imposition. Civic properties are different, and they're not like, as you, as you just said, Nick, they're not like most of the rest of the downtown, so I think that's, that seems to be an easy change. Any other questions from the board? Yes, Jim. Nick, I just want to clarify on Heinemann. Um, Heinemann fronts on both Foundry Place and Hanover, correct? Uh, can you go back? I, I would. I think you could you could say yes or no to that. Well, and well, the reason is this: Foundry Place is a very unusual parcel. It include fifty percent of it is the street. The other fifty or less. The other fifty percent is actually 
the parking garage, it became lot one in the subdivision. So unlike most streets that have a 30 to 50 foot right of way and they run right down the street and pick up the sidewalks and the utilities, Foundry Place actually covers the typical street here that's uh, 40 or 50 feet wide. But then this was merged into the lot. This was merged into the lot. It comes, the district itself comes right over into the Rock Street Park, but there's a plot of land here where a building used to stand that currently has a retaining wall left on the side of Foundry Place that uh, I think you and probably others are aware of was in the paper that the owner of Heinemann is looking or speaking to the city about a portion of that site uh, that remains right here along the back of Heinemann. So for all, all intents and purposes, let's assume that this green line will be the building height limit for Heinemann, which, re which is a duplicate to the green line here. So if this doesn't happen, if that stayed, if you were to say, hey, what, let's just take the green off, this is still a 40-foot building based on Hanover Street. Okay. Well, when I looked on the tax map for Heinemann, yeah. there was definitely frontage on Foundry Place for Heinemann. There are, there's frontage, but there's a strip of land there that the city would have to sell for this property to have actual access to Foundry Place. Well... That's probably true, but there's a big grade difference there. But yes. again, I'm, mentally, I'm just trying to confirm that the Foundry, Pla the Heinemann property fronts has a butts Foundry Place. It's an odd shaped lot, and also the parking lot fronts on Hanover. Correct. So I just want to be 100% sure that both Heinemann, when it fronts on Foundry, and when it fronts on Hanover, is 40 foot height limit. If they're both green, it's 40 feet from front to back. If this was actually brown, as you recall, when we first did this, this was a brown line, which would have generated this through lot condition with a 50-foot height on the back and a 40-foot uh, height on the front, which would have resulted in the 50 feet going from here to within 50 feet, which is about here, to Hanover Street. So it would have increased the building height and the development rights associated with that property. That's why we pulled it back to the green. Uh, okay. I think um, there were a number of people that brought that up, and the okay. intention here is not to increase their development rights as part of these amendments. Any other questions? Um, Nick, I just have one generic question about heights in general in the, in the city. Um, I think at the last um, work session, I was curious about the zoning and many of these green colored lines have height variances from two to three stories, two and a half, four. And it's a range, as you know, it's a Correct. range of height. And I, I, I'm a little slow in taking up this stuff, but and you made it clear to me that HDC has the authority when you have that range to set the range. Correct? Yes. I mean, and I think importantly, I said within reason, right. they've got to be able to justify not allowing somebody to fully utilize the allowed building height right. with good grounds for doing so. But, so I was yeah. curious, what would you consider good grounds for not going to the maximum height? I would say if the building height map, if you were at the uh, foot of Penn Hollow and Sheaf Street where you have uh, a corner lot condition or you've got short buildings on one street and, and they're right next to tall buildings, there may be an instance where the building height is overpowering the street. And the example I gave last week, which is a real one, is 77 State Street, which is the, uh, the wine bar building with the mansard roof at the corner where the Exxon gas station used to be at the foot of State Street. That came in with a 59-foot building with a full five floors, and the HTC, through a, a protracted uh, discussion with the applicant had them reduce the fifth floor to a penthouse, set it back in order to reduce the scale of the building. So some development rights were lost there uh, for the applicant uh, and their expectations to have a five-story building from front to back. They got four and a half stories instead with the penthouse. Okay. Would you consider following the master plan a good reason for the HDC not to go to the maximum height? Oh, absolutely. If the master plan had any significant level of detail to speak to that issue. I mean, it would have to. It, it, it can't just be we're afraid of height, so we're not going to do it. It's going to have to say in this neighborhood, here's the desired building height. 
So I, I, I don't want to give anybody the illusions if it's two to four stories that, you know, the HDC can just sit up there and, and uh, demand two-story buildings because that's the lower end of the spectrum. I, I think yep. the, the expectation is we're, we're comfortable with the ceiling. That's why we passed the code at three, four, five stories. Uh, but the burden is on the applicant to demonstrate that their product is designed well enough to fit into that, that parcel at that height. Okay, thank you. Just so everybody's clear, and especially the public, we have two, two criteria for height in our regulation. One is stories and one is feet. There are absolute foot limits of the height. And because you can have different d dimensions between your uh, floors on a building, that's why you could have two to four, but still capped at a, mm -hmm. a specific height. All right. Um, and the McIntyre is a great example of that with about 18 feet used per story. It's a very unusual. So only a four-story building, and it's 62 feet in height. So that, that code, is why we have stories. The code requires and certain, like this first floor has to be a minimum height and certain things like that. But that's why it's not really, there's a range of stories. There's not a range of heights. The heights are fixed mm -hmm. as, a, as a limit. And then you've got bonus criteria. But I just want that to be clear. Any other questions? For the public, no other board questions. Oh. Open the public hearing. Anybody here wish to speak? Two, four, or against the proposed zoning amendments. Good evening. Um, I think there's some confusion because there's a sign-up sheet back there for public speaking, and yet this is the public hearing. So I'm not sure what that's all about. Is it just left over from another meeting? I'm, I'll, I'll try to find out about that. but <laughs> I don't need to know about it. I'm just saying it's Thank a little you. confusing you because I would think that a public hearing is not necessary to sign up, but I did. Happy to. Page Trace, 27 Hancock Street. I'm here tonight representing the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America in the state of New Hampshire. Euphemism, NSCDANH. We are the owners of the Moffat Ladd House. I've been here to every public meeting work session regarding the zoning. I would agree wholeheartedly that we need to take a look at the zoning of civic properties. Further, if that's what you're going to do, I would ask that you leave the Moffat lad alone. I'm singing the same song that I have sung every time I stand up here. The fact of the matter is the Moffat lad house is a full four stories. There is a dormer off the back of the house. Um, and it's a full three stories, and then you go upstairs onto that fourth story. And the dormer was there. It's a full height up in there. And it was used for um, pigeons, doves coming in and out of the house directly. It's a full room. So currently, the principal planner has the front of the Moffat Ladd house at, I think the new one is two to three stories. And I'm just saying, nothing is going to happen to the Moffat Ladd house, dear God. I know there are some who have suggested that what happens if there's a fire. That is not something that I ever wish to discuss. Um, I never wish that on any any national landmark or historic building in this city ever. It's one of the reasons why we have um, brick buildings today in much of our downtown. That said, please do not change the zoning for the Moffat Ladd House. And I say that because I'm beginning to think it's personal. Uh, the last public work session you had four lines that were new lines for the Moffat Ladd House. Now there are five. Why? You know, honestly. So please, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for telling us about the sign-out sheet, but 
Don't worry about that. Just come to the podium. Good evening. Petra Huda, 280 South Street. Um, I'm going to refer to um, the handout, uh, page three. And I'm still confused by number 10, 5A21-21 on building height. And in the red, you're adding um, the, the historic district um, has explicit uh, approval for building heights in the historic district. And in the staff comments, it says to make explicit that within the historic district, the HDC has jurisdiction over height, scale, and mass. So I was confused about this, so I went back to the planning board handbook, which is part of the state's um, handout for planning boards. And what that says uh, is basically in a historic district, uh, the regulations must be compatible with the municipality's master plan, of course, and then your zoning ordinance, mm. uh, which we have. As it goes down in the paragraph, uh, it actually says a municipal um, municipalities that have historic districts um, established which have not adopted a zoning ordinance, the HDC has the same authority as the planning board within the bounds of the historic district. So my confusion is we have, uh, we have adopted ordinances. So does the historic district have final say on this or does it refer back to the planning board and the zoning ordinances? It also goes on to say, Persons aggrieved by the decisions of the HDC have the right to appeal to the Zoning Board of Adjustment. So then I went to the Zoning Board of Adjustment handbook. And in there it has Historic District Commission Appeals. This is uh, referencing an RSA number 67717, uh, which says, this empowers the Board of Adjustment uh, in municipalities that have enacted a zoning ordinance to have appeals. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but basically this is, uh, it says this is one of the hardest things that they have to do, and it goes down to all of the uh, ordinances that I ha they have to um, apply. So bottom line of my question is, who has final say here uh, as we're discussing the height, especially in the historic district, and we're discussing projects that are, that are on the line right now for this? Uh, as a resident, who has done this, um, I guess I'd like a legal answer on who would have final say on this. And I'll be back with the rest of my stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Esther Kennedy, 41 Pickering Ave, and I apologize when I wasn't here the other night. Um, I was on vacation, and like many people, I guess I'm really upset that the city decides to do this in the summer when many of us are on vacation, but that was a decision. Um, I would like to know a little bit more about the waterfront corner um, and what is on page 4 of 12 and where um, that is divided because I guess um, I'm a little concerned about and questioning the frontage and the verbiage in there in particular when it comes to waterfront. Because in many cases we have a buffer zone that is not determined at all in this. And the other thing is we have public area at the low tide line of a waterfront. So I guess there needs to be some little clarification there on that particular part. Um, you know, I, I, I'm really concerned about the height in Portsmouth and I have been all along. I'm concerned that when we want to look at Portsmouth, you go to WMR, the first picture is of Portsmouth. It's not of downtown folks. It's not of the tall buildings. It's not of the large buildings. It's of the waterfront. When you look at everything public that comes out of Portsmouth, you look at the US um, information they put out about submarines coming into the base, it's all about the waterfront. 
is about that is the picture of Portsmouth. And I'm really worried that, and I've seen it for years by Nick and others in the city, that our picture is changing and it's not there. I don't see any pictures of downtown in any of the, the front of any commercial thing that goes out to the look at Portsmouth. So I have to question it. Why isn't it there? Why aren't we taking a picture of the AC Hotel and putting it on as our emblem, as our information? It doesn't look right. So in this um, zoning, you are making some decisions tonight. And I know you're doing cleanup, and I've heard cleanup all along, but there's some decisions made here about who's in charge, whether it's the ACC or it's the planning board or the zoning board. You're making some decisions about height and what it will look like. And I guess my question is, what will Portsmouth be? How will we be different? Why, will I want to, why do I want to come to Portsmouth? Why do I want to be a part of this environment? If it's going to all be big and build out and have these large things and look at Bow Street, that's gone up, then why don't I just stay in Boston? So you're, you're making some life-altering decisions, and I just ask you to really consider it. And I really think you need to look at the waterfront, because I think there's some things wrong there. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm coming here in, on behalf of a number of our folks that are, oh. Your name, name and address, Oh, please. I'm sorry, Kelly Orr, and I'm 260 Odeon on Point Road. Thank you. And I'm here on behalf of a number of the residents that are along that area, along with Sagamore Road, where there's a number of condos that are going to be coming in. Not the Golden Egg side, but the other side. We've had some condos be put in. I know there's an agreement now for 1169 and 1171 where there is an agreement to have a sidewalk put in front, but it's more the sidewalk extending towards town and not the other half, which is going towards the edge of Portsmouth. Um, it's been in the budget for several years to have that full sidewalk be extended. Um, it is Route 1A. A number of us, including a couple of friends who are here, we walk as adults down this, along with trying to navigate the cycling that comes through going down to the beach and going to the beautiful Newcastle area. Um, as well as we have a number of children in the neighborhood. It's a very small portion, and we found that one of the condos that was put in um, in a closed-door meeting, there was supposed to be a sidewalk put in on behalf of that condo, and something happened that it didn't happen. So now that we have a few more condos coming in, um, in particular, uh, they would be responsible, and I imagine not responsible for the whole section, but the section at least in front of their whole frontage. That would also benefit their condo owners because there was a beautiful spot within Tucker's Cove that could certainly walk as well. But just the number of folks and the traffic that goes on both cycling, children, adults walking, it's precarious. It's also a big route for children going to Portsmouth High School, Portsmouth Middle School, and we want to make sure we protect those kids. Also, I know not supposed to be jumping that bridge, but there's a number of kids also walking to go jump that bridge, good or bad. Um, we just want to protect them. So on behalf of you know, my, my neighbors, I know there's a letter that's going to be put through by our neighborhood, but I'm just hoping that could be considered when this condo comes in, in addition to make that extended area. It's been pushed, by understanding, now to 2024. Let's just nip it in the bud and protect the people all we can. Thank you so much. Thank you. I guess I, I didn't make myself clear. This first hearing is about the zoning amendments. Oh, I'm sorry. But we're new. I, this is my first, okay. this first okay. one. Sorry about that. Your, your, comment, your comments were, we, we heard you. Okay. Right. This is about the zoning amendments. So anybody else wish to speak about the zoning amendments? Or, or, your time was up anyway. I'm so. good, but thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak about the zoning amendments? I want to be a second time speaker, so are you up to them yet? I mean, a, a second, yeah, a second You could be both. I could be both. All right. I'll go for it. My name is Elizabeth Bradder, property owner, 159 McDonough Street. I hope you got a chance to read the public comments. I know there were, you had over 2,000 other pages to read, so thank you if you did. In the book, Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth, Colonel Hadfield states, there is nothing more important than what you are doing now. 
As you review these ordinances and changes to building heights for civic and municipal lots, this is so very true. Like everything in life, there may be many opinions, and it is awful di often difficult to come up with reasonable solutions. What is most important to remember is what the impact of those solutions are, and can changes, stipulations, or recommendations be made to address some of the open concerns. Having read the proposed written ordinance changes and compared them to what exists, each one seems to clarify the many questions that have come up regarding height from mansard roofs to adding grade. They are clearly prescribed and include definitions which aid in understanding the details of the ordinances. Please approve these as written. The building height standard maps changes are pretty straightforward. The majority, change, the majority of the changes match what already exists. Some of the proposed heights may need to be reviewed more closely, possibly changed, such as the back of St. Episcopal the St. John's Episcopal Church, the back of the Hanover Garage, and Foundry Place. Foundry Place could be left as presented on the Foundry Garage side of the street, and the opposite side of the street could be lowered to blue for the entire street, possibly yellow, with the stipulation that 66 Rock Street, the Heinemann Lot, all of Hill Street, and the lower part of Bridge Street be forwarded to the City Council and ask that this entire area be sent to the Land Use Committee for review of heights, overlay districts, and zoning with the time constraint to be sure they get done. This area was notified in 2019 regarding zoning, heights, and overlay, and was poised with realistic changes. Therefore, the request for a time constraint. It is my understanding that municipal lots, lots will not be receiving CD4 due to the ordinance being different. If they are receiving CD4 zoning, they, like the civic lots, may need to be looked at more closely because a lot of municipal lots are playgrounds and they are often in residential areas. I do want to clarify that the front of Heinemann lot is green and it only has the downtown overlay district on it. The back of the foundry of, the, of Heinemann lot does front on Foundry Place it is above the probably 10 or 12 foot high piece of property owned by this city. Do I need to come back from my tent two more minutes? If anybody else wishes to speak before you for the second round, any other first round speakers? Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So in regards to Heineman, the front on Hanover Street is only in the downtown overlay district. And if you look at page five of what I submitted, it shows you that very clearly. But the back side on Foundry Place has both the North End Overlay District, which allows a one-story height increase with community um, space, and it has the Downtown Overlay District. So therefore, the request to have Foundry Place lowered on that side until the whole issue with Hill Street can be resolved. Please try to cover as much as possible by moving things forward which seem positive and moving things forward with changes stipulations or recommendations to keep the positive changes and address those things left open for discussion. Thank you. I'm assuming that the civic districts are not going through today or you're going to vote on that first. I'm I understood. Sure. I understood the civic districts were being recommended not to move through today. Is that correct? That's up for discussion. The, okay. board, the board hasn't made a decision yet on that. Okay. So in that case, I just want to say that um, that the civic districts, um, the, the four that I, the civic districts in question for me, which sit in a CD4L1 or MR row, are, one, are the 43 Middle Street, 16 Court Street, 40, 143 Pleasant Street, and 200 State Street. And those are ones that I would want to have looked at um, to have a different zoning than CD4. But otherwise, the rest could stay CD4 because they match what's next to them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other second time speakers? Thank you for allowing me to speak a second time. Page Trace, 154 Market Street. Um, I can't thank you enough for looking at this. 
I understand the need to shore up the holes as you see them, but I'm standing here again and I'm saying, please, um, to my mind, I can't speak for any other nonprofit, any other national historic landmark. All I can say is that as the president of the NSCDANH, I am asking you on behalf of an entire membership to leave us alone. I can't say it more firmly. We are good neighbors. Mr. Simchek would say that we're good neighbors. We have no problem with the height of his building at the moment. As much as I can tell you, we will not change the height of ours, nor will we build anything in our gardens that we're famous for. They allow people to come and sit there on a hot day. We are also a good neighbor to the city in that we participate in Children's Day. We have educational programs. We contribute a lot to this city despite the fact that many don't know who we are. We would welcome people to come and visit us. Perhaps that would give some a greater idea of how important it is to us to maintain the direct view corridor straight down to the water. I could pass away tomorrow, I could be hit by a bus, I'm sure some would be thrilled, some would not. Uh, the fact of the matter is, um, <laughs> sorry, if it happened, there's somebody to take my place. And if the house burnt down, God forbid, there is enough financial backing from the organization, both statewide and nationally, that the house would be rebuilt to spec. There would always be a Moffat Ladd house. We take our charge very, very seriously. And we don't, I, I don't know how to say this other than we really don't need someone putting in five lines now, count them. All you need to do is put a few vertical lines and we could all be playing tic-tac-toe. Um, I can't say it more strongly. I am asking you all very seriously to respect the fact that we are a national historic landmark. We are a state society. We are part of a larger 15,000 member organization and we are not going anywhere. And as long as I'm alive, that house isn't going anywhere. So please, I'm asking, please table it and leave us alone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Petruda, back again. Okay, to continue with my first question, um, also, in the planning board handbook, chapter one or five, working with other boards and organizations. Uh, the main title of this is who's first? A planning board may grant final approval on a project that a, panel, a planning board may not grant final approval on a project that violates the ordinance. Either the planning board or the ZBA could grant a conditional approval. However, as a practical matter, it is generally makes more sense to suggest that the applicant obtain the necessary approval from the ZBA to seek planning board approval. Consequently, it is often more economical for a developer to seek ZBA, ZBA approval first and then proceed with the engineering and go to the planning board. So I guess I would ask you, once I get the answer to my first question, why are so many developers that we see the projects coming forward now going through the HDC first? because that's, that was the main crux of my, my question. My next thing that I want to ask you is, um, why isn't the discussion on phase three, the incentive amendments, uh, put in with this? That the incentive amendments are all about height. So adjusting the incentives to make something higher with an emphasis on workforce housing only would be a no-brainer. 
This is an easy way. All you have to do is delete the community space incentive and leave in the, leave in the uh, adjustment for workforce housing. And these would all go together. I guess that would, in my mind, that would save you a lot of time. Thank you. Thank you. Since this is a zoning matter, I'm going to answer that question about the HDC. And if I misspeak, you can correct me. Um, the HDC has the authority to, they have more discretion than the planning board does. The planning board can allow up to the maximum the developers proposing. Um, and there are conditional use permits would have some discretion, but otherwise there's little discretion in the zoning ordinance. The HDC is different. And that language that is in the amendment just basically makes explicit what the authority they already have because they can say even though you theoretically could build a 50 foot tall building if the HDC, is, HDC says 35 feet or 34 and a half that's what it sets at. That's one of the reasons I think why uh, developers go to the HDC first because they have more authority in the historic district. I, I, I would just add to that, I, I think a really simple way of answering that is that the planning board, in the absence of any design review criteria, which you do not have, the planning board does horizontal construction and the HDC does vertical. And there, there's a firewall between them. There is nothing in the site plan review regulations that dictate the scale, mass, and volume of the building, footprint aside, and utilities. The HDC, when you're in the historic district, has full design review. So you think of Foundry Place, you think of Heinemann, you think of the two buildings I, I spoke about, the hotel and the mixed-use building on the left-hand side going up to Hill Street. Those are both outside the historic district. There was no design review done on those buildings. They have to meet the height requirements, but there's no HDC to even say, hey, make that a little bit shorter. Uh, in contrast to the other two lots that uh, the same owner owned where Wells Fargo and the bank is. So the historic district is really important until we have, till such time as the plenty board has design guidelines for properties outside the district. We don't have anything. That's why the West End Yards looks the way it does. That's why Cinemagic looks the way it does. It's not something that we have uh, teeth uh, in our ordinances to talk about the aesthetic impacts of some of these developments that may or may not fit in. So um, I just wanted to make another couple of comments, if I could, to respond to some of the questions. I, I think it's important for people to realize in respect to the civic properties. So we've, we've been here for about 400 years. In the first 300 years, there were no regulations on pretty much anything. There was no zoning. You, you could build whatever you could, you could pull off. From the 1920s, to almost the 2020s, every property had dimensional guardrails, had requirements, including all the civic properties, including these nine, including all the churches and civic buildings that are not in the downtown. They still have height restrictions, they have setbacks, they have dimensional controls. So if you think of the church on Woodbury, you think of the churches on Lafayette, they're not in the, the uh, the civic districts because they're not in a character district zone, but those churches, those museums have height restrictions, have setbacks, and all nine of these properties had them for a hundred years. The CBB, which was the central business district B, was a 60 foot maximum and had uh, open space requirements and setbacks. That all disappeared when we adopted the character based zoning in 2013, downtown 2014 and the north end. So. It's important to recognize there was a hundred year time frame here where everybody had guardrails on what they could or couldn't do on their property. So uh, we don't currently have any of those restrictions today since 2014. And the idea here was to have a conversation about it and see if there's a need to do it um, for those properties. Uh, in respect to, I want everybody to understand attics. You, you heard some discussion of dormers. Anything under a pitched roof is not a story. And that's very clear in here. If you're in a gable, you're in a mansard, you're in a hip top, you're, you've got dormers, just because you have living space doesn't make it a story. It's very clear in the current definitions, not what we're changing, that those do not fit within the maximum two, three, or four, or five story buildings. You're allowed to put things on top if they're in a pitched roof or a penthouse if it's recessed from, from the edge. Um, you know, we're, we weren't proposing uh, the CD4 
to be used for any of the municipal properties. It's only the building heights and it's only a, a guideline for the city. Should the city ever develop any of those parcels in the future, it would at least, right now they're fully exempt. There are no uh, caps on height or the build out of a municipal property. So these are intended to be guidelines to offer the community some and, and the the people that make decisions on surplusing any of that property in the future to give them some sense of what what a reasonable building height might be if any of those were to you know parking lots to be converted into whatever they are you know buildings um i think i'm just about done sorry did you put the timer on him i should have the waterfront last one the waterfront that was a question raised about what's up with the waterfront we are only clarifying that where building heights are assigned to the waterfront, which they are in the west end and they are in the north end. There are building heights along the pond. And many, uh, Rains Ave, Green Street, all these properties that go from Rains Ave or, or Green Street to the water, they have building heights that are on the water and building heights on the street. So they, they have to look at the code and we have to look at the code and be able to uh, readily discern which of the two heights applies and to what portion of the property. So the waterfront uh, language is in here, but it's just to uh, clarify what's already on the books in respect to properties that are on both streets and waterfronts. There's no change in any of the, the building heights along the water. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you. <clears throat> any other members of the public wish to speak? Mr. Kennedy, 41 Pickering Ave. And since I brought up the waterfront, um, I guess what I was questioning was where was the information and inclusive of that when you're talking about, like they said, the front frontage can be the front yard. Um, where's the setbacks? Where's the, net, the honor that the fact that the state really controls some of the waterfront? Um, and where's our buffer zone? So those, those are my questions. Um, I, I want to support what. Uh, uh, Paige Trey said, as someone that is uh, looking to become a member of the organization, um, I really want us to keep our historical perspectives. I've said that numerous times up here, and I will continue to say that. At one point in 1992, um, when I went to get for my first permit on Barley Street, I had to go to Historical B. At that point, we had Historical A and we had Historical B. Um, you know, I guess. The question I have, and, and I know Nick just explained that um, this is adding things and this is kind of looking at controls of things, and, and I don't see it that way. So I guess I would like to know um, where that all fits in in this new plan. Um, where does the protection of our city fit into this plan? And lastly, um, as we're, we're looking at um, making some changes and looking at um, clean up. I heard that. Well, when are we going to clean up the parking issues? When is that going to come into the plan? When is that going to be talked about? That you, When you build something, you have to have parking for it. That's not in this plan, folks. And if we're doing some tidying up, I think that would be the first thing we would tidy up in our city is really looking at what does parking mean as we build and we decide to build huge buildings and destroy our historical character. So I would hope that as you um, talk and, and contemplate tonight, you think about those things. Because right now, I see that as a big dilemma. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Is anybody on Zoom? Stephanie? Last call on public comment. I'm going to close the public hearing. It's up to the board now to have a conversation. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, if I could, I, I, I have listened to a lot of comments tonight, and I, I feel like, um, I feel like the matter before us has been 
so overcomplicated, to be honest with you. There's a lot of discussion that's been had that has nothing to do with the decisions we're making tonight. Um, um, the consideration of destroying our historic district is not what we're considering tonight. And the talk of waterfront buildings um, is a, a bit off, uh, out of lane as well tonight. It's, it's the tallest buildings in our, in our city on the Sears Street side are our waterfront buildings. They're the tallest buildings in our city. In some cases, they're taller than Port Walk. And it's just, it speaks to the, uh, the fact that the quality of a building is far more important than, you know, than its height consideration. And most of what I'm seeing tonight that's presented to us is, um, is in fact clarification and cleanup. It's not, I'm not seeing any major pieces that are threatening the character of our city. I, I really don't see it. And um, maybe there's something I'm not seeing that I need to be convinced, but I, I, I see that we've reacted to um, you know, Nick went through several points that are in reaction to um, several comments made in, in past meetings. I mean, we've seen this presentation several times, several times before. We're not seeing new information. We have we have letters from um, residents that prove to me that it is understandable. We have we have a, a letter in front of us that is several pages and um, um, which proves to me that this is understandable. This is understandable to our community and to our boards. And I, I don't think that, um, that we need to overthink this. Um, my, my opinion, I just had to get out after. Thank you. I, I, what I heard, a lot of the comments uh, basically tie back into what we first started talking about was regulatory changes and master plan work. That, I, I think a lot of those comments relate to that. So any other comments about what we're looking at are zoning amendments. Yes. Can I make a motion? Is the board? I want to we'll make sure the board. After we make a motion. We can talk. Sure. Go ahead. <laughs> I figured it would move the conversation okay. a lot. Yes, you may make a motion. <laughs> um, I make a motion that we move to recommend to City Council uh, the changes as we have been talking about with the. I'll leave it on my glasses here. Uh, with the additional changes since the work session, so the cemeteries, the decorative railings, um, I think that's included in the decorative railings, yes. And if I have a second, then. Is there a second? I'll second. Discussion? You, Beth, you um, like yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I've been looking at this phase one for a really long time. Um, and I think it's gone through a lot of changes and updates. Um, there's been a suggestion to take out civic districts, and I have no objection to that. But in order to get this conversation going, I wanted to actually make a motion so that we could talk about it. Um, you know, the civic districts were, we thought, as Nick has pointed out, you know, after one historic property came to us and we realized we hadn't remembered to give them any sort of design standards, but we can table it and talk about it later. It wasn't key to what we were trying to do, which was just um, make some changes that made sense because of the way projects have come forward. So adjusting the infill and where we're, you know, those were the important things. So I would like to see it move forward if, um, you know, if we want to remove the civic districts, I have no heartburn over that. We can look at that and put it back into the rotation of all the other things that we do have lined up and a lot of things that were brought up tonight are in queue to be looked at. We have actually a very long list that goes beyond even the work plan um, that we have in place now. We're already talking about what gets added to that. So we have a lot of the things that everyone's talking about in our radar and we're going to be looking at it, but because of there are only so many of us <laughs> and there is only so much staff capacity and we are a very busy city. So we do have to take these one small chunk at a time and that's what we're trying to do. So I'm hoping to move this one forward because very soon you're going to be seeing the changes to the ADUs coming up rapidly. Jane. Yeah, um, I, first I'm gonna make a couple comments and um, then I'm gonna disagree with you, Beth, on your, in your position, because I, I feel that the reason that we are talking about revisiting the master plan is because now we're scrambling in a way that is like the cart before the horse. I feel like 
I know that the master plan is our citywide vision and should be driving all of the development, should be driving what the building heights are. We should have been able to do this exercise before the buildings were built that are now five stories high and or with, you know, half story penthouses, which I don't know when that came into the city, but all of a sudden everybody's got a penthouse. Um, so I, I am going to repeat what I've said many times in these planning board meetings, which is with the land use committee per the city council's decision to come in with a specific agenda, whether, the, whether it's clean up, however you want to characterize it, that then pulls the planning board into those specific issues instead of doing what we are mandated to do, which is make sure our master plan is real with full public input is really guiding the changes and even the revisions and refinements that we're talking about. If this is so minor, let it wait until we've revisited these issues in the master plan. Number two, with regards to the waterfront comments, I think building heights and waterfront are intimately related. I think it's totally relevant in this discussion. If you have a high building height, you're going to block so much of the public view to waterfronts as a minim at a minimum. And one thing that is stated clearly in our master plan is that public views and actual literal walking public access be maximized in this town. So I don't think that it's irrelevant at all. Um, so on that note, um, I'm, I'm really distressed that we are doing this after all these buildings are already built. Um, I think we should definitely revisit the incentives um, that the city offers because I don't think the city has really benefited from getting all of this additional height and mass and scale. Um, <clears throat> So at a minimum, I think we should take the civic properties out of this discussion for now. Um, otherwise, I'll just vote no on all of it. Um, and I reluctantly will vote yes on what is seen as a cleanup because we are doing this backwards. Point of clarification on this one particular thing. The city council asked the planning board to look at this set we're looking at tonight. This isn't a land use committee document. This was something the city council asked this board to do. And this board has been working with staff to try to do that. I think there's, there's some tension about the land use committee. I understand that. Um, there's cross pollination. I guess that's the word between the planning board and the land use committee, but it is what it is. And it is trying to do a lot of the things we've been talking about. One of the reasons we had the first item on the agenda was so this board could do more itself. And that requires time and effort by us. You know, I've suggested it a few times at the end of meetings and didn't get anybody signing on because it was late and people were tired. So that's one of the reasons we put it at the beginning of the meeting just so we could have this conversation. I will suggest, and it's only a suggestion, in the spirit of cooperation, we try to advance this to the council because it really is cleanup, what we're talking about tonight. It's not the big issues. The big issues are things we need to look at. They were looked at once before. What's been built has been built in conformance with the zoning ordinance that was done in accordance with the master plan that followed a process that we can do again because Times change, people change, cities change. You need to look at these things. What's the current feeling of the people of the city of Portsmouth? I don't know. We won't know until we have public input. Our planning director is a master, mistress, whatever. She's, she's, she's very good at public input. And we will have that process going. But this really is not, believe me, I've looked at this in extreme detail. That's why I support taking the Civic out. 
This is not doing anything to damage this city. I feel very strong about this city, as everybody sitting at this dais does. This is a good thing, and it shows the spirit of cooperation with the council we have to work with. There's a lot we have to do with them. I'll stop. Uh, very, very well said, Chairman. Uh, as this, um, as the the individual who seconded the motion, could I amend? Is it possible to amend uh, to remove the civic consideration from the decision? You can propose that. Um, I proposed it. I just wanted us to have a discussion before great. we actually did it. Great. I have no problem pulling it out and relooking at it. So that was a proposed to remove it, and you've agreed to that. So we have a revised right. it's motion. As but is with the changes, less the civic district changes. And, But I didn't want to stop conversation. Mm. That was not my intent. So nor, nor was it mine, yeah. I, I, I didn't take it that way. Uh, so I'm pleased. Anybody who wishes to speak, I just, I, I really feel, as I said, I won't say any more. Who else wants to? Yes, Jim. Uh, I'd like first to thank Nick for the work on this. I know it's been long, and uh, I really appreciate him changing things when people give him information. That's uh, that's always a good thing to do. And uh, I, I like the chair. Think this is a good idea in general. Obviously, no one's perfect. These regulations weren't perfect when they were created, so it's good that we come back and clean quote, clean them up once in a while. Unfortunately, there are, are just a couple items I can't agree to. I, the vast majority of it is is a, is a good product, but what's giving me heartburn is uh, the high uh, Haven Court uh, height adjustment. I know it's not a big deal. It's it's pretty minor in the big scheme of things. And if this had come up three years ago, it, it probably wouldn't be an issue for me. But there's an active project there, and I think it's really bad optics for the city to change zoning in the middle of a, an application, especially when the ZBA has already denied it. So that's why uh, I, I can't uh, support that change. And my second, uh, it, my second issue is with uh, DSA Lot 2. I understand that's in very complicated legal proceedings and uh, which that whole deal may fall apart with regard to what DSA got for the park, and therefore I'd rather leave that property alone. And I think it may give the city a stronger negotiating hand if that park doesn't have a, if it's just left with no height, and therefore I think the vast majority of the city would rather have that be a park than not. So um, if the motion goes forward as is, I, I'll be voting no based on those two items. Thank you. Anybody else? So that it's clear, taking CD, taking Civic out includes the paragraph about CD4 and the height designations on the map. Yes, correct. Yes. Are we ready for a vote, or do people want to talk more? Can you just clarify what exactly we are voting for? The package as presented by Mr. Cracknell, with removing the civic properties from the height map and the paragraph, I can find it, um, that talks about using CD4 designation for building placement on uh, civic properties. And so there will be a second vote to follow for the it's remaining. All. It's all together. And we added the cemeteries and the decorative railings. It would be removing um, item 7A on page 4. Is that correct, Nick? <coughs> I want everybody clear on what we're talking about. Do you understand it now? So it is to vote on the height changes as the packet was presented with the stipulations presented by Beth, by Councilor Moore. And taking the Civic out. Correct. The, four, the nine properties that Nick showed on the map, on the, on the screen. I don't see any hands raised. We have a motion, a second. Everybody in favor of the motion, aye. 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 Opposed? No. No. Motion carries seven to two.
Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for their comments. Councilor, or Chairman, excuse me. Yes. I just wanted to let it be known I abstain from that vote. Oh, I, I thought I heard you say. I guess I didn't hear you. Okay, no. my bad. So it's uh, six to two with one abstention. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes. Everybody had a chance to look at those. I make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Any discussion? No. We good? Those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, minutes pass. We need determination of completeness. Uh, the first one is request of Christopher H. Garrett Revocable Trust to 2007 as owner and applicant for property at 1299 Islington Street. Requesting preliminary final subdivision approval to subdivide one existing lot into two lots. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Step to this complete. We have four site plan matters for acceptance. I'll read them through. Requested. This is proposed as one vote. Can we do one vote to accept all four? Okay. Request of HCA Realty Inc. as owner and Portsmouth Regional Hospitals applicant for property located at 444 Borthwick Avenue, formerly Zero Borthwick Avenue, requesting site plan approval for the construction of a satellite parking lot. Next is request to Sagamore Group LLC owner for properties located at 1169 Sagamore Avenue and 1171 Sagamore Avenue requesting site plan and review approval to demolish existing buildings and construct 10 living units. The third is a request of Road to West LLC as owner and applicant for property located at 140 West Road requesting amended site plan approval to improve and install stormwater infrastructure, relocate dumpsters, install landscaping and increase parking. Fourth is a request of Lanza Biologic as applicant for property located at 101 International Drive within the Pease Development Authority requesting a site plan review approval under Chapter 400 of Pease Land Use Controls for a cafe expansion. I have a motion to accept those four as complete. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? They are all accepted. First hearing. Public hearing, we have a request of HCA Realty, Inc. as owner in the Portsmouth Regional Hospital as applicant for property at 444 Borthwick Avenue, formerly Zero Borthwick Avenue, requesting site plan review approval for the construction of a satellite parking lot consisting of 501 spaces and associated on-site improvements to support the existing hospital facilities currently serviced by 783 parking spaces. This property is on the assessor's map 234 lot 7-4A and is located in the office research district LU 22-47. Who's here to speak to this application tonight? Uh, thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm Patrick Crimmins with Ty and Bond here on behalf of the applicant, um, Portsmouth Hospital. Also here with me this evening is uh, Matt Larkin, the chief operating officer of Portsmouth Hospital. Uh, we are, I will try to be brief given the time already this evening and the number of applications behind me. Um, we are here this evening seeking uh, approval for a satellite parking lot that is located across the street from Portsmouth Hospital on a vacant piece of land. Um, as you can see here, the existing hospital. Um, is this going to work? There we go. Situated 333 Borthwick. Our site sits right here, which is now 444 Borthwick Avenue. Um, the existing, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the existing parcel, as you can see, is located at the uh, corner of Elaine Dondero, Foley Boulevard, and Borthwick Avenue. Um, it's also bound by Unitel uh, behind it to the south and uh, another parcel of wetlands to the east. Um, you could stay on that slide for one sec, Steph. So the, pr the purpose of this project is, is what it is. It's a satellite parking lot expansion. Um, as you can see by this graphic, um, Portsmouth Hospital currently has 783 parking spaces on its site, which is woefully short of what is needed for parking on the site. I think for anybody that has visited this hospital during uh, peak hour um, can attest to that. So what we're doing is we're here seeking uh, 
request for a satellite parking lot on the parcel across the street so that we can uh, meet the hospital's current needs and also hopefully plan for uh, growing services provided by the hospital, similar to the ED expansion that you guys approved last month. Uh, next slide, Steph. So this is a challenging site. Uh, it is hindered by a number of things, um, one being a uh, large wetland, which you can see here. Um, it's also hindered by an overhead utility easement, which between those and building setbacks make this a very challenging site to develop. In fact, back in 2008, we attempted to do so with a medical office building on this site. Um, we, in fact, even got state approvals for drainage, but we did not. We stopped the process when we hit the concom and realized the challenges that we were going to meet between the buffer impacts and the wetland impacts. So really, the site, it's so challenged with for development. This is might be the only appropriate use that could be used on this site as is now. Obviously, if you move things, did something differently, sought wetland impact and buffer improvements, that'd be different. But um, So what we're here doing is seeking, it's a 501 space parking lot. Uh, that'll bring the total count uh, to 1,100, uh, sorry, yeah, 1,152 spaces. I'm so <clears throat> sorry. The minimum required parking spaces for the ho hospital is 1152. And what we're, we're proposing to do is add on to the uh, 783 or 501 more spaces. Um, so what we have here is two curb cuts, one being off of Lane Dondero Foley Boulevard, uh, one off Borthwick Avenue. Um, the site itself situated here, you can see there's this larger parking area, uh, drive here and a, a smaller parking area. I think you can see from looking at the way that this is designed that we have worked very carefully to avoid buffer impacts so that we did not have to seek a conditional use permit. Uh, the project is going to require wetland impacts um, to two pocket wetlands, um, one being this man-made wetland that sits within the uh, existing Eversource right away. It was created over time through Eversource vegetation treatment and grading and when they um, up improved the uh, power line several years ago. And then there's another wetland here, a smaller pocket wetland here where we have a much smaller impact. Um, that is from a culvert that crosses the street. Again, it's man-made. Um, but again, we are avoiding the larger, uh, more valuable wetland and it's in buffer. I should add that not only are we avoiding that buffer, we are significantly improving it. We are proposing over 19,000 square feet of buffer enhancement plantings within that buffer to mitigate the impacts to the man-made low-value wetland that sits up along the roadway. Um, you'll probably wonder why are we not doing this on the existing hospital lot. We can't. There is a 385-foot power line easement that crosses through the middle of the parking lot. So we cannot build a structure up. We cannot build around the hospital because we are impacted by wetlands. It basically sits on an island. So unless those power lines get moved, the hospital is very limited in where they can go. So that's why we're looking at this parcel across the street, which they also own and also is hindered for the ability to develop buildings on it. So it's appropriate for the parking and the proximity to the hospital. Uh, we have provided pedestrian connections throughout, um, including this pathway, which when you look at the landscape, it will be heavily landscaped. Um, we are providing uh, dark sky compliant lighting throughout. Uh, there'll be electric vehicle charging stations located here. Uh, there will be a shuttle station located in this location. The shuttle will be running all day for employees. Uh, the intent it, for this parking lot is for employees so that patients and their families have more opportunity to park in the, park, the main parking area. Um, in addition to the parking lot itself, we are providing a significant uh, public improvement in the form of over 1,300 linear feet of multi-use path. Back when I designed this road, I think Beth, you might be the only one that was on the board at the time. Um, we worked very carefully with um, <clears throat> the planning department and the traffic engineer at that time to design this multi-use path that connects down to the rail to trail and also connects out to Islington Street. Uh, this path will become another piece of that. And ultimately, when completed all the way down Borthwick, we'll tie into the West End Yards, leading to the North Mill Pond Trail, so it is a vital piece of that connection from downtown to the um, rail to trail project. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, please. The project's going to 
provide significant uh, stormwater improvements. Um, we are proposing, you can see there's two large detention areas in this location and in this location. Uh, there will also be treatment units, advanced treatment units, um, treating the stormwater, and we're also providing, while the site is very limited in where we can provide infiltration, we did find one spot uh, in this bottom corner to provide infiltration to meet state standards. The stormwater itself has been reviewed extensively. It has gone through a peer review process, both at the city of Portsmouth. We actually received comments today. Uh, that was our third letter, I believe. Um, we've had a good review process with Altus. Um, they did have, an, I think we've addressed almost everything or partially addressed There's maybe three or four outstanding comments that we're confident that we can address. I think that's reflected in your staff memo. Um, we're confident it's basically just relating to the modeling and how agreeing how to model the stormwater, but I don't think it's gonna have any impact on the design whatsoever. Um, in addition, this project will require an alteration of terrain permit. It is being reviewed by the state. We in fact review, received those comments from the state today. We have received four small comments. We've already addressed them, so we will be submitting that package tomorrow. We're anticipating a permit early next week from um, NHDES. So this stormwater has been reviewed extensively. Um, next slide, please. Uh, utility plan, very basic, not much utilities. It's just really electric pulling in for the power in the EV charging stations. Next slide, please. And this is the landscape plan. You can see uh, providing landscaping all throughout the parking lot and then through the meandering path. I should have mentioned with this path, we are installing a rapid flashing beacon for safety for crossing the street. We're basically mirroring the condition that's down the street at Liberty Mutual so that it's safe for uh, pedestrians to cross the street and uh, ident show vehicles that this is a crossing. Uh, but you can see here, parking, th uh, landscaping throughout the parking lot, complying with site plan regulations, and I think even more importantly, this really reflects the significant buffer enhancement that we're proposing. Um, we've been to TAC three times. Uh, we received approval at TAC in June with stipulations. Uh, we included a stipulation status report. I won't go through those in detail. I think the uh, staff memo reflected that we addressed most with the exception probably of we still had the peer review ongoing and, and I, we still have it ongoing. It's but very minor comments left. Uh, we did read the staff report. We don't take any exception uh, with the stipulations. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take questions. Any questions of the applicant? Yes. Can I ask for consideration of other parking availability I know in um, previous conversations, the use of Liberty Mutual's parking lot has come up. Can you just talk, to, speak to why that is or is not an option? Liberty Mutual's parking. The adjacent parking lot. Yeah. Perhaps that's a Matt question. Yes. So I'll have Matt come up. Matt Larkin, Chief Operating Officer from Portsmouth Hospital. Hi, Board. I'm Matt Larkin, Chief Operating Officer of Portsmouth. Karen, thank you for the question. Um, right, we have talked to Liberty Mutual a couple of times, but they have not given us the option to park there. Um, and so we've really chosen to, on our own land, go back and make those parking spaces for our employees so we can get our patients closer to the hospital. Um, so we have tried that already, but that's not been an option for us. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Larkin. Um, I'm really interested in this uh, Liberty Mutual option because uh, even before COVID, they have about a thousand spaces out there, I believe, and it, it's rarely, I might see a hundred cars in there even before COVID. And um, have, do you have anything in writing as, as a formal request been made to Liberty Mutual? Because it just seems to me such a waste that, that Portsmouth Hospital is being forced to build this parking when they filled six acres of prime wetlands in the 80s and they're not being used and it just, uh, to me, as an eco-municipality and our master plan talks about low-impact development, that I, uh, I, it really concerns me that, that this option can't go forward. And I, we can't make you, obviously. Liberty Mutual doesn't want to play ball, then they, they don't want to play ball. But I, I, it's really hard to watch this being built when I drive by and that parking lot's empty. Yeah, it's fair. I, I can't speak for their decisions, uh, thus it's hard for me to really answer that uh, that well. Um, besides the fact that we have tried, we have had conversations, and you know, from a project perspective, we've really focused on what we own, what we can control, to be honest with you, to make this as quick as we can to serve the community. So I, I'm probably not the best answer for you, but that's right. what I have. I, I understand, but 
I just had to follow up on that to make sure that that you're satisfied that every option has been made to try to use that parking lot. So thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Andrew. Mr. Larkin, uh, this question is actually for you as well, and you just alluded to it. HCA is a participant in this community, and they serve this community, um, and it's excellent. And obviously, we're very fortunate for that. But as much as HCA is local, they're also not based here uh, entirely. So as residents and community participants as well, both this board and the people in the room, we have a renewable energy policy that was enacted by the city council in 2017 and one of the main core levels of that is uh, focusing on municipal users or residences businesses etc to achieve net zero energy and kind of adventure and explore alternative energy sources so if there was an opportunity to receive a property tax abatement on this property or for the hospital itself would you consider doing a solar canopy on this lot it would depend on the size and the scope of it. I really couldn't answer that right now without talking to Patrick and the team. But. Look, I mean, I think we all want the hospital to remain and things like such a power consumption of that area um, is great. However, we can't really just continue to approve these asphalt fields and, and not really work towards this renewable energy. They, they counterbalance each other and uh, that's not helpful for anyone. So. We'd like to at least propose that and, and explore that together, um, I think, just to achieve a lot more of these initiatives. Understood? Yes, Jane. Yeah, I just have a couple questions. Um, the first one is, can you, can you just explain to me again why you can't build upwards, like have a parking garage? Is that due to the utility lines? Steph, can you go back to that aerial site plan? Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. The, the high power transmission line that comes directly through the parking lot right here, it pretty much hinders the entire parking lot. It's 385 feet wide. We can't build anything up. The only thing we can do is actually have parking there. And then the hospital itself is surrounded on all sides by wetlands, so we don't have the opportunity to expand outward. So it's, it's hindered. It has no ability to go up. Just, it seems too bad. It seems like that would be something that you thought about when you originally designed the hospital to me, but okay. Um, and then my other comments are, you have a very small s snow storage area. Um, is it sufficient? And how will you determine that whatever is used f to prevent, like de-icing materials, et cetera, don't in any way Yep. For so, the pollute wetlands. Yes, it is sufficient. Um, and also, there, I think there's notations on the notes about snow management and when mm -hmm. they exceed a certain height that they have to be hauled off site. It's, it's going to be similar to the operation of Portsmouth Hospital across the street where they, they need to keep an open field so that there's enough parking sufficient and that they're not impacting it. Uh, with respect to salt storage treatments, it's all explicitly um, they're very well guideline we have a whole operation and maintenance plan that was included in the uh, stormwater uh, study analysis but that's in that just that one piece of snow banks is sufficient for storage of the snow across the entire parking lot it's a, it's actually an entire aisle of parking because we exceed that it's that whole aisle of parking that is uh, just below the um, the ADA space is there, and then yes, there's another area on the smaller parking lot. We we feel that that is going to be sufficient. And again, it, if it exceeds or hinders any other beyond that area, it has to be hauled off site. Um, my other question is about the um, EV chargers. Are those going to be superchargers, or what are those exactly? I don't know that answer. Um, I, I don't know. Matt does either. We're just trying to designate a placeholder. That neither of that is our expertise, but we're just trying to hold a placeholder for electric vehicle charging stations. Because hmm. there's a big difference in, you know, ability to charge. I'm not really familiar with it, truthfully, so I can't answer that question. Um, and then my last question is about, um, yes, there's a lot of shrubs in your landscaping plan along that multi-use trail, but is there any way to have some actual trees 
so that Borthwick Avenue has a chance of looking more like a boulevard, like a tree-lined boulevard than it currently does, which is just open parking spaces in huge, massive buildings. Uh, so there's a few things. Well, the biggest reason for that is where, where I know where you're speaking of. It, it's probably out at the curve here where it's just shrubs right along here. Yep. It's, um, it's all rock. It's all bedrock. So you're not going to get, there's going to be no tree health there. So that's why we're, we're just trying to plant low ground plantings. But also it, it's to make sure that the, the path itself is also visible for safety. Okay. One second. Uh, new. Yes, Jim. Uh, Mr. Crimmins, um, I'm just curious about how this, uh, maybe it's not a sudden demand, but maybe it's just been a gradual demand of parking over the years. I, I understand the hospital was built in the mid 80s. Is that close? Yes. And so have, have there been additions to that weren't accounted for more parking or you're going from about seven or 800 spaces to 1300 and I'm just curious how this bulge of demand happened I guess is the best way to describe it there was uh, there was an addition in the late 2000s I, I don't know if it was at the time the ordinance didn't have the same demand for parking or if we were shy I can't recall truthfully um, but that would be the one large expansion I guess that did occur um, Okay, again, it's just curious again how. But I guess, I guess I'm just thinking even practically if anybody's driven to this hospital during peak time, it's. Oh, I understand the need. I'm just curious about how it came, yeah, came about. I, yeah, I think, you know, to your point, we did, there was an expansion in the late 2000s. And um, maybe no parking was included as part of that? Well, or? there's no place to put parking. Right. Uh, there was small areas of parking expanded in the back loading area along the edge of PAVE. There were parallel parking spaces in, in like, which were meant for employees, basically. Um, we tried to squeeze in spots where we could. I think we actually used porous paving or something in that area. It, it failed because of the trucks that went through there. It ultimately had to go. But um, yeah, there wasn't any parking added as part of that. That was more of a vertical expansion. Now, will this current amount of parking with this addition, will that serve your current needs or has there been a buffer included for expansions of the hospital? Uh, it'll serve the current need. Um, and then, yes, the, the idea is to build the little bit of additional parking that we can to uh, service any future expansion so that if and when, you know, while we're not, ex we're not getting to the max parking at all, we're kind of like right in the middle between the min and max. Uh, but we are trying to plan for any future services similar to the ED expansion that was um, brought before you folks last month. You know, obviously I said it's really challenging to expand on the site. They can really only go vertical within the existing footprint, which also is challenging given structural implications. But uh, perhaps if they did any retrofitting within the hospital, they added beds, they could have these additional parking spaces to support that. So when they go for the building permits, they comply with parking. Okay, thank you. Andrew, and then you, yeah. Jane. Again, back to Mr. Larkin. Uh, um, does Portsmouth Regional Hospital use any alternative energy sources now? Well, we're starting. At, we're starting actually in our operating rooms to do a lot of kind of reusable, and um, but generally speaking, we don't have a, a master plan for that, which we will. So there are no kind of initiatives to implement any renewable energies? There's lighting initiatives and things like that, especially in our new buildings, like the radiation oncology one. And Patrick mentioned in our, our expanded ICU. So we do all the new buildings we do. It's the existing plant that's, sure. that's a little bit older uh, that we're still trying to work through. Yeah, I just would love to see some sort of initiative and at least effort towards that as, uh, again, we've just saw another proposal from you all to do another addition. and. Uh, a lot of these things take a lot of energy consumption, and so on top of just having a, an asphalt field in the middle of Portsmouth, we'd like to at least make it a productive one. We are constrained by our regulations, so, you know, I think yeah. point, point, point yep. well taken. Definitely. Well taken. That's all I got. Yes, Jane. Um, I, back to, like, your, um, your possible expansion. So if you had further need, how much does the hospital does the hospital own like lots more land like you could come back to us in like five years and request another 500 spaces is there like adequate at acreage there for that 
Uh, no, there's uh, so the hospital doesn't have any more land. It's the main campus across the street and this, which obviously you can see to the extent we are building with by avoiding the wetlands and the buffer impacts. Um, and then across the street, it's it's on an island. So the only way for them to really expand without, you know, kind of fitting up or doing the small expansion similar to last month, those power lines have to get moved. That That's, I, I keep wondering, I, well, have you talked to Eversource? Yes, we have had extensive conversations with Eversource about moving those power lines and what the costs would be and the implications. Um, and it's going to take a number of years, serious dollars, and big wetland impacts to do so. And that's probably an understatement. That is an understatement, and that is why we are doing this here. You know, back to the question of trees, too, not to, you know, hit a dead horse here, but you do realize this entire area was forested like 40 years ago. So to go from that to, you know, the specter of, you know, just asphalt parking spaces with, you know, a small building on the south side of the street and large massive buildings on the north side of the street, it's, it's not good. It's not good to the environment. And here we are with over 9,000 square feet of wetland involvement. It, it's, it's not something I like voting yes on at all. I, I don't agree with any of the principles behind it. So, but because, because of the one condition that you don't find that there's no other appropriate place for the size of this parking lot to be built, I feel like I will be back ended into a yes. It's a very reluctant yes. Any other questions of the applicant? Thank you. I'm going to open the public hearing. Does anybody here wish to speak to for or against this application? Is there anybody on Zoom? Second chance. Anybody wish to speak to for or against this application? I'm going to close the public hearing if nobody raises their hand. Public hearing is closed. Board's discussion. I'll make a motion that we vote to grant site plan approval with the Included stipulations 1.1 through 1.10. I'll second. And I believe we need. Oh. I'm not sure where they go. Oh, you have them, though. Uh, with a slight change to 1.2, uh, applicant shall agree to pay for the services and oversight engineer to be selected by the city to monitor the construction of drainage infrastructure and any work in the right of way. And the applicant will address any additional remaining comments provided by Atlas as at Altus. Oh my gosh, I can't talk. Sorry, as needed. <laughs> I can't get my big girl warts out. Thanks. Second, agree with that addition. Yeah, I just I, I didn't know if that had, had had that been part of a dis, it wasn't part of the discussion when the applicant was at the podium. I just didn't know if it's this something. I think else. I think he actually said he was on had ongoing conversations. Yeah. So I think right. I think we're good. I, I will I will. Um, second, yes. Discussion. Just curious about the. Um, I'm sorry. Yes. Go ahead. Um, I see the conservation commission denied, or, did, or they didn't deny. They did not recommend approval. Um, they want a, a second opinion. Could someone clarify exactly what CONCOM's issue was? So essentially, one of the wetlands that is being impacted is a 9,200, I think, square foot wetland, which falls below the um, jurisdiction of the city and is a state reviewed permit. Uh, the Conservation Commission did recommend denial, but wanted to have, if it you know, wanted to make a recommendation that um, as a, knowing that this goes to the state and not to the planning board, it's not a jurisdictional wetland, that they do a wetland delineation that is very close. 10,000 square feet would be the threshold um, under which it would become a, a wetland that would require a wetland CUP. 
and given the fact that, that we weren't did, understood that it hadn't been a recent wetland delineation, they asked that a stipulation be added that the and this has been added to the stipulations of approval that a wetland delineation to um, uh, ensure the size of that wetland wetland is correctly represented. So that is the the reason for that. If it is, it would have to receive a wetland CUP. If it's larger, as it, uh, in the final analysis. Any other questions or discussion? We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> motion carries. Thank you, folks. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if it's appropriate, I'd like to make a motion that items 5B and C be discussed together and voted on separately. Second. Thank you. That's where I was headed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for prompting me. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. So we're going to consider together request a Sagamore Group LLC as owner for properties located 1169 Sagamore and 1171 Sagamore Avenue. Requesting site plan review approval for the demolition of three existing principal structures, three single family, three single living units, and three <coughs> existing accessory structures to be replaced with six single living unit structures and two, two living unit structures to total 10 living units and 22 parking spaces where 15 are required. Properties are shown in assessor's map 224, lot 14, and assessor's map 224, lot 15, and lie within mixed residential MRO district LU 21-167. Also, the same group requesting wetland conditional use permit approval under 10.1017 of the zoning ordinance for 570 square feet of temporary buffer impacts for the headwall and riprap portion of which are permanent impacts to the wetland buffer for the installation of a treated stormwater drainage outfall. These properties again are on assessor's map 224 lot 14 and 224 lot 15, same districts. Who is here to speak to this application? Good evening. Uh, for the record, uh, Mike Garibay with Garibay Planning Consultants. Um, I'm representing Sagamore Group LLC. We have Mick Kavari here with Kavari Architects and Paige Libby with Jones and Beach Engineers. Uh, in the event you folks have questions that I won't be able to answer, which may likely happen, um, I did I promise Corey Caldwell that we would only be 10 minutes in front of you, so that's our challenge tonight if possible. Um, so I'm going to try to be brief so others can be heard tonight. Um, I don't know if we want to just, uh, if, if we can move to the existing conditions slide, I can kind of just give you folks a, a brief sort of overview of the site conditions and the proposed conditions. So it would be sheet C1. So as the chair has indicated, the, the site is consists currently of two um, lots of record. Uh, they are in total of uh, slightly less than two acres in size. There's three uh, single family residences on the property now uh, proposed to be, the site's proposed to be scraped. Everything's proposed to be demolished. Um, I was here before the board under a preliminary consultation about a year ago or so when we started this process. Um, and I think we showed something similar to what we're, we're proposing, um, which obviously has gone through some iterations as we've gone through staff review and, and TAC review. Um, if you uh, go to the next slide, which is C2, um, it'll show the proposed condition, which is um, a single curb cut um, proposed off of Sagamore uh, with a circular drive configuration um, accessing four duplex units and six single family units on the site, uh, which represents the density that's allowed in the zone. Uh, we we didn't require any variances for the project. Um, we did <clears throat> go through um, several TAC um, meetings. Um, drainage was the, the the biggest consideration for this site, so we we were subject to peer review. Altus Engineering did our peer review for us, um, and well, on behalf of the city, rather, um, and so it took a, a few few uh, few meetings to get through that process. Ultimately, it was determined uh, and suggested by DPW that we um, engineer a culvert across Sagamore, uh, which will 
serve. And if we go to sheet C3, I always get the button wrong. Is it the top button or the bottom button? Top button. Top button, thank you. So we are, uh, we do have a collection system of drainage, uh, for our drainage. We have two underground uh, chambered systems. We have a couple of smaller rain gardens proposed on the site to, to treat, capture and treat drainage. And then ultimately, um, there's a small area here, a small depress depression here um, on the, the northern side of the site, and we're, we're proposing to have a culvert that will go across the, the roadway um, and will outlet onto the city's property across the street. That's been designed um, as recommended by DPW. That's the reason why we have the CUP uh, permit in, in front of the board as well this evening. Uh, we did go to the Conservation Commission uh, a month or so ago. We had a favorable site walk. We had a favorable meeting with them where we received unanimous uh, recommendation to support the CUP for the small impacts uh, with, respect, with respect to the culvert as it impacts some of the buffer on the other side of Sagamore Avenue. Um, and then I guess the only other thing I wanted to point out, um, just as a brief uh, overview, is DPW did want us to, and TAC recommended that we do provide a sidewalk along Sagamore within the DOT right away that will connect us to Sea Star Cove, which will eventually, you know, begin to connect the sidewalk further, further south along Sagamore, as, as we all know, it's a fairly busy road for pedestrian and, and bikers. So I, I want to keep it as brief as I can. Um, like I said, Mick, Mick Kavari is here to talk about architecture if you have any questions about the design of the units. Uh, and we have Paige here that's um, done all the design, engineering, drainage uh, work for the site. She can answer all those technical questions you might have. Questions for the applicant, Andrew? Um, the drainage, anal drainage analysis was obviously very comprehensive, and I'm wondering if you guys looked at the 1177 or Sea Star Cove development as a residual impact over there, and if any of those neighboring homes would be influenced in any way, whether it's rainage, high rainstorms, snow melt, et cetera. We did. That was, a, that was part of the focus of the peer review, and in fact, Sea Star Cove, the association, and then Bill's here <coughs> representing um, the association as, as its president. I'm sure he'll speak this evening, uh, but we worked with Sea Star Cove um, uh, fairly extensively um, to ensure that the drainage, uh, our drainage design does not impact uh, the neighboring properties. In fact, that's one of the reasons why the culvert was, was recommended by DPW and why we pursued that, that um, approach. And so I'm wondering when in certain conditions that the drainage analysis is conducted, what does that assume for the maturity or uh, density of trees that's behind this? So how can we consider the pre-development conditions during construction and post-development conditions? And is there a large discrepancy or disparity between all of those levels or time frames? Now you've gone over here for me, so I don't know if Paige wants to jump in, but um, you know, as far I, I don't know if I can, exactly I can, what the question is, but I I um, can boil the question down to: Is that drainage analysis at one moment in time, or is it over the horizon of pre-development, during construction, and post-development? Well, it's pre and post, um, not necessarily during. Although during construction, there are um, you know monitoring requirements yeah. for stormwater management. But I should probably let Paige jump up and answer more specifically. Hi, Paige Libby with Jones and Beach. Um, yeah, so we study pre-construction condition, pre condition versus post-construction condition um, and compare the pre and post peak flows and volumes, and that's for a 2, 10, 25, 50, and 100-year storm event. So it's basically, basically comparing those two. And like Mike said, during construction, there are erosion controls put in place um, to ensure that there's no effect on the abutting properties basically during the construction process. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, Jane. Yeah, um, I, I'm assuming that they're the only reason for the request for a wetland CUP is due to the this culvert, because the conservation committee has unanimously supported this. So, I'm just going to ask it a different way. So, are you telling me that the wetland, which looks rather extensive, that 
is part of the existing conditions that's at the northeastern boundary of the whole pro of one of those lots. I think it's lot 26, which I think corresponds to at least the proposed building units of one, two, and three, if not also four. That there, that wetland is not going to in any way be disturbed, and it won't be a problem for those building units that are going to be right there. Uh, if you're referring to the wetland that is behind these, these, this duplex. I'm referring to the wetland. You, you don't superimpose these on any of the drawings. Maybe easier to see it on. Um, C1. If you look at C1, yep. there's an extent. That's the existing conditions plan. There, there's a large. This, this is this. This is shown as a as a fill area. So this area here is is a, a historic, a fairly old fill area. So there's urban fill in this area we're proposing to remove all of that um, and so are you saying it's a depression without water in it that is not a depression it, it's a slope uh, and that area was filled historically years ago um, you know with rock and concrete and what have you that's all going to it's it's all going to be removed and re replaced obviously with building um, and where it's not building will re replace with with, with suitable materials around the buildings. Then could you just show me what you refer to in your plans as the wetland that's on lot 26? There's a wetland that is on, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out where you're showing lot 26. <coughs> that, that's the adjacent parcel. It says it's parcel. somewhere so in the narrative. Lot 26 is across Sagamore. It's owned by the city. Um, so there's a wetland system that's on, on lot 26. We're not impacting the wetland at all. We're just impacting a small portion of the buffer, a couple hundred feet of impact for the culvert. The culvert is primarily there uh, to uh, for the additional runoff collection that we're going to be. Uh, I keep pressing the middle button. It's not good. <laughs> um, so for the for the sidewalk that we're, we're proposing along, essentially on the, the neighboring northern neighboring parcel. We're creating the sidewalk to a, to connect to our development, and so we're going to be collecting that stormwater that's, that's going to be coming out of Sagamore, <clears throat> and that's that's the stormwater that's essentially going to be treated through the um, through the proposed treatment system that that we have at the at the end of the culvert, um, which will then or at the beginning of the culvert, I should say. Um, that will then discharge across the street. So the the main reason for the culvert is is primarily for the, the proposed sidewalk. And so the fact that you're putting in 20 parking spaces and more asphalt, that there will be no pollution of that wetland at all as part of the stormwater or part of the runoff that comes from vehicle oils and gasoline and that kind of thing. Well, as designed, and, and Paige can speak more to it, but the, sy the system is designed to collect and treat and then release o over time uh, all of the stormwater on the site. We did have our, obviously we had Jones and Beach design the stormwater system. We had peer review um, by Altus. We had DPW review, and we also had um, the, the neighbors uh, from Seastar Cove had their engineers reviewing the plans as well. We were sort of all working together. so. We feel feel very comfortable and confident that it will work as designed. One of the staff conditions um, for approval, um, which, by the way, we are comfortable with all those recommended conditions of approval, but one is a third-party inspection of stormwater, sewer, water, and sidewalk installation. Um, so that'll be a third-party inspector, I would assume Altus, but perhaps somebody else. Uh, and then the the ongoing will be stormwater inspection and maintenance reports on an annual basis that will be conducted um, and then um, provided to the, to the city to ensure that the ongoing operation of that stormwater system is functioning uh, according to design. Okay, thank you. Sure. sure. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Garvey? Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the economics of parking and how you selected to go to 22 spaces when only 15 were required by the city ordinance and just kind of walk through you know, the logic as someone who's trying to sell these homes and 
why you didn't choose 15 spaces. I thought you might save money or be able to offer them at a lower price. Sure. Well, the, the, the parking itself is simply a, a it's, the, it's the driveway. We assume two spaces per driveway. It's, they're two-car garages, so there's, there's actually more parking than, than right. one would. Uh, but the driveway functions as a parking space um, technically. Um, is, it a, is it a parking space or isn't? It's a driveway as well. It's a, it functions as both. It's hard to eliminate those parking spaces when you need a driveway to get into your garage. So the only, we could eliminate the visitor parking, mm -hmm. which is the only parking I guess we could eliminate, which I believe only represents a couple of spaces. I think it may be three. It's two. The code requires two spaces. And we'd be happy to mm -hmm. eliminate those um, well, if, if necessary. Again, I'm not advocating changing the parking. I'm just sure. trying to understand as, uh, you know, you're in the business of producing housing that you want to sell sure. and create a product that people want. So um, would, would you find that even without a standard, you put two, you put two spaces no matter what the unit was? Or again, as you know, Portsmouth has a parking based on a square foot basis. Sure. With the smaller the unit, the less parking. But would you find that two spaces would be needed no matter what size you, you, the product was here? No, I think I, I think the the spaces are provided simply because it's a dual function space. It's a driveway and it's it's a parking space. There's no other way to access the garage without having such a area. You, you, back, you backed into it. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, if, if we number. if we were doing a multifamily project, we'd try to you know we we build to the demand. Right. So um, there there are two car garages, correct? Correct. And then you have two spaces in the parking lot, so you've got plenty of parking there. I would agree. Okay. Yeah. Again, I'm just. Yep. Uh, I'm just trying to understand, sure. the, the, you know, how it's thought of when it do, when you're doing so much more than our yep. regulations require. Yeah, in, in many in many instances, in uh, other applications for other communities, we with multifamily projects, for instance, we a lot of oftentimes ask for waivers to the parking standards because we don't need as much. Um, so, because the empirical data suggests otherwise, then perhaps the regulations may require so when we can we do uh, in this case it's kind of almost impossible to do so because then there'd be no way to get to your garage All right, okay thank you yep do you have an easement from the city for that outfall for the culvert we have a recommendation from staff and I would assume we would hope that that recommendation would follow through with your vote this evening um, again it's a our our drainage design um, worked um, without the culvert, the culvert as DPW, I guess w the culvert's basically an overflow, um, an emergency spillway, if you will. Uh, it's not necessary for the design, but it's something that um, DPW wanted to see on the plans. So we have, uh, we, we do provide it, and um, so we would, uh, we, we know we need to go to council for that approval, for that discharge, for the outflow. So you will be seeking an easement for that? It'll be a, a how, whatever form the legal department and the planning department uh, decide that it needs to be advanced to the council. You know, it'll be some kind of an easement for flowage, correct? Okay. Yep. Yeah, but and again, it's primarily to benefit the city overall because of the sidewalk and the drainage treatment that it uh, provides. So we, you know, we assume that we'll be received with a favorable vote. Uh, especially given the fact that the CONCOM is supported as well. So, yeah. And I don't, I don't want to drag everybody into a arcane discussion here, but I'm, I'd like you to explain you, your drainage structure B in the northwest corner of the property. It's built up quite a bit in grade because you're building up that back corner of the property quite a bit. Um, you're six or seven feet above existing grade with the building corners, I believe. So you're putting in uh, these concrete chambers and they're obviously well above grade because you're trying to match the grade for the drainage of the buildings and the parking. And then you're putting a, a coat of earth over it. Why is that not a structure like a swimming pool would be a structure? This is where Paige comes back up again. Yeah, so that structure is entirely underground. Um, it's, it's actually like an underground detention system. Um, so for that reason, it's not defined as a structure. Where does it say that? 
Um, I don't have the regs with me, but it's my understanding that's the, that's how structure is defined, is that it's, it's anything above grade. Okay, as I read the definition of structure, it doesn't have that exclusion, and it does include swimming pools. So um, you take the position that basically anything underground would be excluded. Yeah, and I also think it meets the, it meets the building setbacks, regardless of if it was defined as a structure or not. Um, the, the building setbacks are 10 feet to the side, 15 feet to the rear. That west corner of the structure meets the 10 feet? I don't think so. If you look at uh, C2 and just project that 10 foot setback that you're showing. It's not. It's it's certainly close. Um, so I think we have the ability to just shift it slightly, so that it can meet that. I didn't. I did re receive a note that swimming pools are exempt from setbacks under our regulations, as long as they meet a I think a eighteen uh, inch standard. So. Stairs and decks. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. What? I'm sorry. Swimming pools are exempt from setbacks as long as they meet an 18-inch standard. I understand that from staff. Mm -hmm. They are defined as structures, which aren't exempt. So I'm curious where that comes from. Okay. We can definitely look into that for you, but that's my understanding. Yeah. So it's if, if it's, I guess, I guess if it's an issue, you could shift it a couple of feet. Yeah, we. I think we have the ability to shift it. The, the chambers kind of come as separate um, pieces right. that. We have arranged in a certain way to fit in that area. So if we had to rearrange them, or they even make small, different size ones, um, we could rearrange that if we had to. But it, again, it was our understanding that those do not need to meet the structure setback. Well, that's a question you can, if the board proceeds, you can work that out with staff. Where is the outfall? Is there an outfall for that structure B? So that structure is actually infiltrating um, the stormwater, which is why it's raised up so high. And any overflow from it goes to the second chamber um, that's sort of in the middle of the site. And then the overflow from that goes to that depression. Okay. Okay. So it's all kind of interconnected. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Any other questions? You ready for a motion? I don't know if anybody else has any concerns about whether that is or isn't a structure. Public hearing. Public hearing. I guess we have to have, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I was up pretty early this morning. We open the public hearing on this. Is anybody here would like to speak to for or against this application? Yes. Hi, my name is Rocco Simone, 1167. I abut the wetlands. Um, I, I respect one of the board members over there. They're putting 10 pounds of sand in a two pound bag. I know that's, I don't have their esteem knowledge and everything like that. I've lived there. The 20 parking places, that's gonna shove water to my house. And they've been grudgingly that, that uh, what is it, across, uh, whatever that uh, one piece is, that was brought up by Mr. DeFosses at the, you know, the DP. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is if they only did five units, they wouldn't have to blast, which I'm also opposing. They wouldn't have all this water that they can't say in five or ten years what's going to happen. Jones and Beach is saying, oh, we got these baffles, we got this, we got that. There, there's no way they can say that. And the way the wetlands is set up, that could flood every year. So I'm just saying to you folks, they're going to take away a lot of the trees. Uh, there's no need for 10 units there. Five units, they would replace every unit that's there. Then there wouldn't be that much water coming towards the northwest where I'm at. So that's what I'd like you guys to consider. Um, 
most, most of these people don't live here. They come in from Dover or wherever. They're going to be gone. I, I think it was presented, who do I talk to when my property's flooding in a few years? Oh, whoever comes after them or their little condo association? That's what I'm all worried about. You know, why don't you just go with 15 uh, of, the, of the parking spaces, stuff like that? Um, it's not that I'm against the development. I'm just thinking that this is too much. The, the two pieces of property, if you look at them, they have uh, like a ledge running through them. So they're going to have to do a lot of blasting. And that's what I'm worried about, too. So um, that's basically what I got to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else like to speak to for or against the application? Please state your name and address for the record. Uh, Bill Bowen, 1163 Sagamore, Unit 40. I'm part of the condo association to the west, uh, Sea Star Cove. And we also own the area just to the north that lies between the development and Rocco's. Uh, there's a, a swale, whoops, go on. Uh, there's a, a wetland swale just to the north, at the north end of their property that really is probably two thirds on our property. And that, their original plan was that the water would go to that spot on our property. And if it would overflow, it would go onto Rocco's. And then if it overflowed from there, it would come down into our system that we have uh, put in. So we, we were very uncomfortable with this system. And the, 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 their property is about 10 feet higher than ours. And they're going from like 15% uh, impermeable to 65 percent or so. So there would be a lot more water and, and we're downhill from it and, and from us to Tucker Cove. So, so that's kind of where we started a year ago. Uh, we've spent lots of time. We, we hired the engineer that designed our system to work with them, uh, at least as a comfort factor for us that uh, we weren't we were really able to understand what was being done. Uh, the key, to, the key to having it work is, is the culvert that goes from the wetlands, which is to the north, uh, under Sagamore, and to the wetlands that the city owns to the east. Uh, without that, I, th I think uh, we would be, Rocco's likely to be flooded, and, and we would be flooded as well. Uh, I don't know, there's, there's water that generates from the road as well, and that will go into the culvert, and then will go underneath the Sagamore to the city wetlands to the east. And there's water that will come from Rocco's uh, uh, yard because of the uh, putting the sidewalk there and having the, uh, uh, the water from the street flow in that direction. So, so hydraulically, it really is a, uh, a complicated subject. Uh, we feel comfortable f that our interests are being protected, uh, that the culvert is the, is the key answer. Uh, and we've got, uh, so we're, we're satisfied after a, a year's agonizing over it. Uh, there will be more water. Uh, it, it will come from an area that does have uh, uh, parking and, and vehicles on it, uh, and it will uh, flow into a wetlands area, to the small wetlands area to the north, and then through the culvert to the city, larger wetlands area to the east. Uh, we're okay with it. Uh, we, we did want to have the provision uh, of having a third party look at the installation to make sure that it was being installed according to design, because uh, it does go from like 45 analysis sure. points in the construction of all the underground plumbing. Thank you. You will have another opportunity to speak if, uh, if you need it. Does anybody else wish to speak to for or against the application? Good evening. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Joe Errico, um, 154 Gosport Road. I'm a resident of uh, Portsmouth since 2007. Um, I live in Tucker's Cove. Um, just right to the south of this project. I think that the residents 
in our neighborhood at least, and I think you've heard this before, um, have expressed concern about the sidewalk. I guess it's it's been an issue that's been kicked down, uh, the, the can's been kicked down the road multiple times. I think the project, as far as having a project, you know, that area developed, I think is great. But obviously there's concerns about, you know, the, I think there's something like 19 children under 10 that live in that neighborhood, as well as when we were living in Tucker's Cove, I mean, when we were living in uh, Tidewatch, we would walk to the forestry center and just walk through that beautiful neighborhood and into the forestry center and then back around to the city. So obviously, you know, just using common sense, um, it's a busy road, it was mentioned here already. I think it's just very important that, I know that they said they were gonna extend the sidewalk from half of there of this project but how do we get the rest of it built in a timely fashion before it costs the city a lot more money than it would right now. For example, if someone gets hurt or, God forbid, killed, not only would you have to build the sidewalk, but you'd also have a lawsuit on your hands. So, you know, you're better off doing it now and paying the, you know, you know paying the cost now or having the developer help contribute to that or it's going to cost us a lot more in the future. Also, if there's, I'm just trying to think out loud how we could work together to make this happen. If they have extra spaces that they don't need, could they potentially sell, the, you know, five to seven of those spaces to whoever might live there and use some of that money to help extend the sidewalk all the way to Odeon Point Road? I mean, I'm just talking out loud. I'm just trying to get creative. If you guys can think of some other ways, but... The sidewalk really needs to happen. It's, it's one of those things that eventually the city's going to pay one way or another. And I just hope it's not with somebody's life. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else here in the room who would like to speak two for or against the application? <coughs> Hello. Um, my name is Sarah Regan. I'm at 149 Odeon Point, also in the same neighborhood. Um, we go to town by, by foot very frequently as adults going for walks. We see people from the current existing condos that are on the corner of Odeon Point on Sagamore, right, right near where this is going to be. And they come along the area of the Sagamore that has no sidewalk where we're proposing that it should be and I think it's on the 2024 budget um, to have it in there. I think somebody said that. Um, they walk along that precarious area as well into Tucker's Cove to walk their dogs for exercise, to access our waterfront easement that we have in the neighborhood, to go to the urban forestry and back all the time. So I imagine that the people that will be living in these new units would also want to come to our waterfront easement and to the urban forestry access that we have, as well as walking through the neighborhood, because there are sidewalks through our whole neighborhood as well. So it's a good walking area. So I request that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak to for or against the application? We have one person on Zoom. Uh, yes, um, <clears throat> Michael Simone, 1167 uh, Sagamore. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I just have some questions like my dad stated, um, <clears throat> co-owner here. Um, you know, <clears throat> we're talking about this culvert and um, counselor before brought up about the um, impacts to the opposing side wetland and uh, we get a lot of debris in my front driveway, cigarette butts, you know, um, nip bottles, beer cans. There's really nothing that states how that system is gonna be maintained with that type of debris um, entering the sub base uh, catchments that they have stated on, I believe, C4. And, um, you know, that type of debris every, every week, I usually have to clean that up. So they were asking earlier, you know, is it, um, how do they do these tests? I don't know. Do you test putting cigarette butts in that <clears throat> allotment? I don't, I don't know. I'd like some more tests done to ensure that these things are, you know, monitored and who's going to take care of that. 
is the city going to take care of that on the other side when things, you know, five, 10 years, something happens? I don't know, because my property is going to be impacted. And, you know, that sidewalk is a good thing, but one person's property, I mean, I put water on your property, you're not going to be very happy. So <clears throat> I'd like some more tests done and keep that in mind. Um, you know, I'm out <clears throat> protecting America right now. I can't be here. I'm out in San Diego. So, you know, those are my statements, but just keep it in mind. You got to keep all the residents of Portsmouth in mind when you make decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak to for or against? Second round speakers, if anybody, no other first round speakers, you may speak again, sir. Bill Bowen again. Uh, we, our, our wish list would also definitely include the sidewalk going down at least already on Point Road. Point Road. We've got uh, five kids in our neighborhood in our 10 houses, uh, as well as a lot of other people that walk, and it really is quite hazardous walking along Sagamore. Uh, in front of the condo unit to the south and then down to at least already on Point Road. Uh, ideally, it should go down to the traffic circle so that people can go down and walk all, all over to uh, uh, to the uh, park. But uh, certainly, we would agree with the uh, need for sidewalk. However, whether you do it as part of this project, don't understand how the city budgeting works, but, uh, but the sidewalk's needed. Thank you. Any other folks wish to speak to for or against this application here or on Zoom? Nobody else wishes to speak? I'm going to close the public hearing unless somebody wishes to speak. Public hearing is closed. Mr. Chairman, before you move forward, I do want to just note that we do plan to extend that sidewalk along the same side of the street. The extent of that and timing I am not entirely familiar with. I know the culvert will also serve that future extension um, and I certainly can follow up with the planning board about those plans uh, because I don't know the extent and timing for that, but I know that there's a plan for that. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, I have a question of planning director, uh, mm -hmm. Beverly. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was just curious how um, typically sidewalks, when we ask for them, are on the frontage of the developed property. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the default position, I understand. And in this case, the sidewalk went on the northern end of the property some distance to connect with the existing sidewalk. Is that accurate? Yes, that's what I see on the plans as well. So was there any thought of extending the sidewalk to the south of the driveway to the least to the end of the property? So I, I actually was wondering about that myself as we were uh, having this discussion. And I'm not really certain why that was not required. Maybe the applicants can speak to that. I do know we plan to continue the sidewalk. <coughs> that gap portion, I, I was a little curious about that myself and uh, asked staff about it, but I'm not certain. Sure. I mean, our, our understanding, whoa, our understanding of uh, the sidewalk our contribution, you know, we typically look at fair share contributions when we when we do our projects, and um, you know, when we first started discussing this with mm -hmm. planning staff and, and and primarily with DPW, th their desire was to c provide the connection uh, to the existing network now, versus waiting for say the Samoan property to be developed if it ever is in the future, and then requiring that that, that landowner perhaps to connect the the two segments. So instead of having a sidewalk to nowhere in front of ours, um, it was DPW's, really their desire to do the sidewalk improvements, not primarily, but partly off-site. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why it's it's done that way. And I think as as Beverly indicated, the future, uh, the near future, I, I believe, uh, connectivity will, will occur, at least it's scheduled. Thank you. That was actually a really good question for before the public hearing, but... <laughs> Oh, okay. We're not supposed to be asking questions to the applicant right now. This is a well, actually, board discussion. Right, but I was more th 
trying to understand from the planning department's perspective why they didn't require it, not the applicant. So, I, my apologies, and I shouldn't have called upon the applicant to answer that. Um, I think that that rough proportionality would make sense, but I can certainly get back to the planning board about the future extension of that. I know that is the plan. I know that was a great deal of discussion, and the culvert, I think, will benefit the city as well for that extension. I know that was, uh, I know it was needed for the project, but it was also something that we feel like in the future will serve that ex sidewalk extension. But I'd love to return to the planning board um, an email just uh, confirming the, or even, you know, posting that um, onto the page so that the community knows the um, timing and extent of that sidewalk extension. I know there's a plan for it. Thank you. Council Moran. Um, to talk about the, uh, since I'm probably the only one here who actually was part of the approval of the condo association next door, we secured all of the easements from Odeon Point Road all the way across that property to put in that sidewalk. So we've been slowly building all the necessary easements to be able to put that together. It is in the CIP plan and it, I believe, and the city manager can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it is fiscal year 24 that that is um, set. So when I say fiscal year 24, that starts July 1, 2023 to June 2024. So in that year, I believe, is when it is um, set to, through the CIP to be put in. Thank you for that. Are we uh, ready for a motion? <clears throat> I will make a motion that we vote to find that the application meets the criteria set forth in 10.1017.50 and to grant the wetland conditional use, per conditional use permit with the included 1.1 and 1.2 stipulations. Is there a second? I'll second. Discussion? Would you like to explain? Um, sure. I. The wetland conditional use permit is truly just um, a way to be able to get across the street and to really, to put in the jellyfish, which I know is a lot of effort. There is a maintenance plan put in place um, to be able to take care of that. And the uh, association, I'm sure, will be of, of the people that will, whatever maintenance plan for their side of the property will take care of. And then the city would have the, give them the easement for the water flowage and I assume to also keep an eye on that. So um, there are maintenance plans put in place when these kinds of systems are put in. So it's perfectly reasonable to go into the buffer when what you're doing is truly cleaning all the runoff uh, to get to the wetland and making it a much better and cleaner runoff versus just everything running into it without any actual culvert or cleaning capability. Any discussion? Yes. I'm concerned about the runoff to the abutter um, that I don't think would be handled by the culvert system as I understand it. And um, I'm worried about the impact that we keep seeing about, so we've taken three buildings and now we've tripled it, more than tripled it to 10 units and the fallout in terms of the asphalt, in terms of there being runoff, in terms of the need for sidewalks. Of course there's gonna be increased need for sidewalk because we keep developing more developments in this area. And the proximity to the beach, et cetera, you know, exerts a pressure all the way down Elwyn Road as well as Sagamore and all through Ode to Odeon. Uh, I completely understand that, but um, we have a letter from an abutter that opposes this, and we've had two abutters speak in opposition to this as well. So I'm probably going to vote no on this, um, and would only be moved to vote yes if there were fewer units for fewer, for less impact. Okay, the current motion is for the wetlands conditional use permit itself, and then the next consideration would be the site plan. Did you mean for the for the wetlands or, or for the everything? I was speaking to everything. Okay, thank you. I'll hold off until the next. <clears throat> any, any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'm opposed. No. 
Seven to two, unless there was an abstention that I didn't see again. Motion carries. I make a motion that we vote to grant site plan approval with the included stipulations 2.1 through 2.6. I'll second. Did you want to explain anything, Beth, or are you good? Um, you know, the density of it um, is allowed by zoning. So, and they've gone to great lengths to be able to really spend a year working with the abutter to be able to make sure that drainage is proper and it's not going to other properties. Um, we can certainly add a stipulation that a year after, you know, a certificate of occupancy is granted, that there is an evaluation done maybe by the third party engineer or I don't really care, Any, anybody who can go out and then certify to the city that it's working as intended and has been for that year. Is it already in there and I'm missing it? Yeah, it's in there. I guess I missed the one. Oh, annually. That's why I didn't see year. I saw annually and I read right over. So yeah, that's already in there. So um, <laughs> I think we're making and taking the proper steps in which to be able to ensure that the abutters will be properly taken care of. Um, the bigger, I think, issue was the sidewalk, which I know is in the plan and has been for several years. And I, I totally understand the issue with sidewalks. We have a lot of neighborhoods in the city that want sidewalks. I know my own neighborhood waited 10 years to get sidewalks. So it's, it's an ongoing problem. It's just hard to keep up with what we have and creating new. So um, I think it's a reasonable development in the area that it's in, and I think it will actually better the drainage for the abutting properties in the end. Thank you. Yes, Andrew. Uh, I have three primary concerns that highlight the site plan itself, and that's primarily the density of it. Um, yes, they do have it by right and per the zoning ordinance. However, uh, when you look at circulation and just population of these homes, you have to assume that you'll have at least three to four people, so three and a half people per residence, you know, and then you have the duplexes and uh, each of these structures or each of these homes are at least 500 square feet larger than the Sea Star Cove homes. When you, and when you drive through Sea Star Cove, you're sort of overwhelmed and those don't even abut the street. So I'm just thinking about the, the density and the elevation of these as they present themselves to Sagamore Ave. Um, and how that could be mitigated or at least curtailed in some way. Um, and, and then secondarily, the sidewalk has been addressed. We get it. Uh, but I think we have to also consider that sidewalk from a pedestrian level, so not just the vehicular uh, viewpoint, but also pedestrian level and cycling standpoint. So as cars are pulling out and trying to look left and look right as they enter Sagamore Ave, it's really important that there is some sort of visibility for pedestrians there. Um, very often on Sagamore Ave, when I am running or biking there, people are trying to pull out and edge their way along, and that prohibits runners or cyclists from really continuing forward, and that could be an issue. And lastly, overall, is uh, <laughs> the duplexes at the street front. I just see a ball rolling into Sagamore Ave, and th that front left or front southern uh, duplex seems to be awfully close to the street front and to me that just I, I'm playing this out in my head and not to dramatize it but that's what I see there and it, it just seems very intense uh, for that site itself otherwise I think the design overall is is adequate and average thank you yes Jim yeah I uh, as many people said would like to have seen the whole frontage of this property with a sidewalk but um, that's a, always a discussion that gets into what's fair to the landowner as far as appropriate offsite mitigation. And instead of having the sidewalk front north and south, they extended it further north offsite to connect with the existing sidewalk. And so to me, that kind of uh, evens out in my mind. And, uh, and actually, to me, the best feature of this is this cross culvert under uh, Sagamore Ave. I, it's a miracle. This property functioned without it. I'm not really sure how it did because it's just a ditch that there should have been culvert there. There just never was. And the 
between the sidewalk, uh, the curbing, and the subsurface drainage. That's, that's a quite a bit of work the applicant will have to do to fix this. And uh, so I'm comfortable with the project. And uh, I, I can appreciate the Butter's concerns about drainage, but I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that this cross culvert under Sagamore should address a lot of those issues. And so uh, that's how I'm thinking. Thank you. I'd like <clears throat> the issue of the uh, stormwater section B to be resolved with staff if, if this proceeds. The, either it is not a structure, not subject to setback, or you will make it conform to setback. I've seen something that says it's not. I've seen something that says it is. I don't think it should be resolved tonight. I think when uh, you guys can sit down peacefully and talk about it, that might be a good time to, but it needs to be resolved. It's, it's an unanswered question to me tonight. The other question I have, do we need a blasting permit? If there's any blasting, they'll need a blasting permit. Yeah. Does that need to be a condition? Doesn't need, it's, it's a requirement. Just a normal? Yeah, it's a requirement, but you. It's like saying you have to obey the, obey the speed limit. I, absolutely. Well, I think what happens when they come and fill the building permit, if that is required, they'll have to get a blasting permit. OK. Everybody ready for a vote? Because we're going to take a break here shortly, I think. Yes. We have a motion without any amendments and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. Aye. Two no's. Mm -hmm. Seven to two. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Being 10 o'clock, we are required to either decide to continue past 1030 or not. I make a motion to continue. I'll second. Discussion? How are folks feeling? I'd rather do it now than come back. Yep. We can take okay. a five minute break. That'd be great. Yeah. yeah. Let's, break. Take, let's take a five minute. Yeah. Please, a five minute um, break. Let's take a break but till 10 10. On let's take a break till 10 10 on that clock. It's about six minutes. And then we're not going to vote on the past 10 o'clock that motion I just made? We should vote on it. Oh, you have to vote Aye. on it. Yeah. Aye. Aye. <laughs> Aye. 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 Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I just thought we should vote before we take a break. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> just, you know.
for Joe. Chocolate to Joe. Thank you. I'm calling a meeting back to order. We have a public hearing scheduled for the request of Katara LLC as owner for property 70 Pleasant Point Drive, requesting a wetland conditional use permit under section 101017 of the zoning ordinance for 11,472 square feet of disturbance within the wetland buffer for grading, landscaping, and to demolish the existing structure and reconstruct a new structure within the 100 foot wetland buffer area. This property is on assessor's map 207 lot 15 and lies within the single residence B district LU 22-112. One, one, two. Who is here to speak to this application? Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Corey Caldwell from TF Moran. Joining me tonight is Rebecca Rowe of Katerra LLC, the owner and the applicant. Joining us remotely, I believe, is Eric Burke, our landscape designer with terrain planning and design. We also have Ben Auger of Auger Building Company and Jason Cook, a project engineer with TF Moran. We're here tonight seeking a conditional use permit for the demolition and construction of a new residential dwelling. On the screen is a color drawing that depicts the site as it would exist post-construction. Currently, uh, there's a three-bedroom ranch at 70 Pleasant Point Drive. It's on a six, uh, 0.642 acre lot. The lot's at the end of a cul-de-sac. It's mostly cleared with six mature trees. The property is located in the single residence B district and abuts the back channel of the Piscataqua River. The home is part of a residential subdivision that was created in the 1950s. The existing home has a footprint of about 1,970 square feet. It's an older style home. It has low ceilings. It has some structural foundation issues and it's not very energy efficient. The home was built in 1957. The applicant is proposing a new net zero home with a footprint of 2,306 square feet. The new home will contain two floors above a basement or lower level floor, which also contains a drive-in garage. A pervious patio is proposed on the south and west side of the home uh, between the home and the river. Because it's a net zero home, it far exceeds the energy efficiency of the home that, that's currently on site. Uh, the new home would be pushed back an additional 15 feet from the back channel of the river. Uh, the closest point of the new home is about 54 feet from the river, where the existing home today is about 38 and a half feet away. We did have a joint site walk with this board and the Conservation Commission on July 6th which gave everyone present a sense of the new versus the existing location of the home, the driveway, and the associated improvements. For those that couldn't make that site walk, uh, the lot's mostly open. It contains a lot of lawn, and it has vegetated very steep slopes uh, that go from the lawn area down to the back channel of the river. This property is kind of unique. It has 336 feet of frontage on the river, and the home sits on an elevated plateau approximately 14 to 15 feet above the river. Uh, most of the property, as you can see from the plan, is within the 100-foot wetland buffer zone, the dark dashed line that runs on the upper quarter or less of the lot is the only area of the lot that is outside of the 100-foot buffer zone. The slopes between the river and the home uh, do range from 50 to 70 percent in slope. Our goal is to improve the aesthetic value of the site and the environmental impact on the back channel of the river. This is being accomplished in four ways. First, we're constructing the new home further from the river than what exists today. Uh, this creates more open space, which allows us to um, plant some of those areas uh, on sheets C three and C4 within our set in dashed red lines we've shown the existing home to be removed. Sheet C3 also shows the existing patio, the steps, and the driveway to give you an idea of what, what the proposed home is in relation to the existing. And when you look at those drawings, you can see that the proposed improvements are pushed back further from the river 
uh, to create more of a buffer between this home and the river. The new home and patio is pushed back 15 feet further, as I mentioned, from the water. The steps are pushed back an additional 30 feet from what exists, and the driveway is approximately 20 feet further from the water than what exists today. This additional space between the home and the resource allows us more room to install additional native plantings. Second way we're improving it is with stormwater management. Today, the driveway and the patio runoff sheet flows across the lot into the back channel of the river. Uh, in fact, all roof runoff, there's a gutter system, if you go out there today, which is collected into PVC pipes, which directly discharge to the river at the toe of the slope. There's evidence of erosion caused by this runoff today and that discharge from the roof. Um, we're reducing stormwater runoff to the river in a couple of ways. First, we're capturing most roof runoff and we're diverting it to the pervious patio via an underdrain or to the rain garden proposed on the north side of the house. The remainder of the roof runoff would go to the drip edges shown on the plan. It then is overland flow to the rain garden or infiltrated um, into the soil. Second, we're capturing and treating stormwater via the pervious driveway. Uh, the result of these stormwater improvements is a reduction in runoff rate and volume as evidenced by the drainage analysis submitted with the application. The third way we're improving the site is we're adding many plantings as shown on the landscape plan prepared by terrain planning and design. Uh, Stephanie, if you could bring that plan up, please. You can see there's a number when you look at the plan, there's, there's a number of trees, shrubs, and landscape beds over and above uh, what exists today. Um, there is a lot of lawn on that site today. That lawn area, by implementing these plantings, is being significantly reduced, which is also going to enhance that buffer. Uh, the fourth way we're improving the site is we're reducing invasive species by implementing the recommendations of the Invasive Species Management Plan prepared by Terrain Planning and Design. Um, that There's a supplement that was turned in with this application that shows pictures of the invasive species. There's a number of them on this site, uh, which we saw during the site walk, and all of those invasive species are proposed to be removed, allowing that vegetated slope to come in with more native plantings uh, to enhance the buffer. The project was reviewed by the Conservation Commission at their June 8th and July 13th meeting. We did receive unanimous favorable recommendation at the July 13th meeting. Uh, there were two stipulations with that recommendation, and that was that the applicant planned for two years of plant monitoring to ensure the health and success of the buffer plantings, and secondly, that the silt sock devices that we chose to protect the buffer shall be made of organic materials, including the outer lining mesh that holds that sock together in order to prevent plastic waste. Uh, the applicant has agreed to comply with those conditions. So overall, we think the site is uh, significantly improved uh, by the reduction of lawn, the increased plantings, moving the house further away from the water, adding some stormwater measurements, and we maintain that we're making the site um, much better than it is today. Myself or a team is happy to address any questions. Thank you very much. Questions of the applicant? Yes, Jane. Yeah, I just want to ask about neighbors. Are there <clears throat> any abutters either to the so each side of this house or in the back? There are. There's a neighbor to the northeast and there's a neighbor to the northwest. Uh, because it seems from the drawings and the diagrams you have that not only is the house elevated on the, the land, the knoll that is naturally forming, but that it's elevated on its foundation. There's steps up even to the house. It, it looks like it's elevated above grade level of that knoll. So is it impeding any of the views or 
anything of any of the neighbors. I, I'm surprised there's no letters from a Butters or comments from a Butters. Sure. So the house is the proposed house is going about one foot higher finished floor elevation than the existing house, but we are building within the height limitation. Yeah. Uh, this zone allows 35 feet, and we're we're not exceeding that. Um, we did not receive any abutter objections. Uh, public notice was made to both conservation commission meetings as well as this meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, I think ample opportunity was provided for them for review. Uh, we've had no negative feedback from from any of the abutters. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jim. Hi, uh, Mr. Colwell. Um, I noticed uh, on, on, C, on the site plan C C three that landscaped wall and steps are entering the Pleasant Point right of way. Is that the intent, and will any easement be required for that? So it's kind of, if you look at the um, uh, the existing features plan, I think it helps put in perspective what what's unique about this is it's a cul-de-sac, but the cul-de-sac was never really built. In other words, there's no circle out there. The pavement just extends through that cul-de-sac. So when you have that cul-de-sac, you have that long arcing curve of the right-of-way. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of distance between the pavement and the right-of-way. We have to bring that driveway to the pavement and the road to get access. And I think for that reason, um, the driveway extends into the uh, right-of-way. I know this was reviewed by staff and DPW. Um, we did not receive any um, any objections to that proposed work from uh, from either of those entities. Okay, so the right of way line for Pleasant Point is accurate. That dashed circle line. Correct. And you will have improvements, stone wall, and landscaping in the right of way. Just, right. Okay. And city so didn't have a problem with that. Yeah, and I think primarily it's because we've got to get to the access point, right? We've got, um, you know, I, I think uh, it was evident from the site walk, as you, as you leave Pleasant Point, the site goes up at a clip, and we've got to get, we've got to get from the, you know, from the house with a driveway out to Pleasant Drive, so we can't, the driveway, because the driveway has to go out there, you really need that retaining wall, otherwise you don't have adequate access. Okay. Any other questions of the applicant? Thank you. We're open the public hearing. Anybody wish to speak to for or against this application, either here or on Zoom? <clears throat> Nobody on Zoom. Nobody wish to speak. I'm going to close the public hearing. <clears throat> Would you like to propose a motion? I will make a motion that we vote to find that the application meets the criteria set forth in 10.1017.50 and to grant the conditional port, conditional <laughs> wetland conditional use permit with the following conditions 1.1 1 .1 and 1.2. 1 <laughs> Second. Any discussion? I mean, this site as a whole is so poorly developed now for being in the buffer, it's it's at least improving it greatly, both with plantings, both with moving out. I mean, you can't really honestly, if there wasn't anything on this site, you'd say it's almost undevelopable. So at this point, based off of its development already, this makes sense and they are improving uh, the wetland buffer greatly compared to what it exists today. So. Agreed. Yes. They are. <clears throat> Any other discussion? Ready for a vote? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? You are approved. Thank you. We have another public hearing on a new matter for Lonza, <coughs> request of Lonza Biologic as applicant for property at 101 International Drive. Within the Pease Development Authority, we're requesting a site re plan re review approval under Chapter 400 of the Pease Land Use Controls. 
for a 4,200 square foot cafe expansion with associated landscaping, stormwater, and infrastructure improvements. This property is on assessors map 305 lot 6 and lies within the airport business commercial district LU 22 131. <coughs> Who's here to speak to this application? Uh, thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Neil Hansen. I'm with Ty and Bond uh, here on behalf of the applicant, uh, Lonza Biologics. Um, so the proposed project we're here tonight for is a small addition uh, to the front of their main facility at uh, 101 International Drive. Uh, the addition is, uh, so this is the overall uh, plan of the site plan. Uh, this is their existing 101 facility, and the area we're focusing on tonight is this <coughs> 4,200 square foot, uh, two-story addition off the front of the uh, main building. Go to the next page, please, Steph. So here's the, the zoomed-in version of it. So it's a 4,200 square foot, uh, two-story addition. Uh, the first floor will be an expansion of their existing cafeteria area, and the second floor will be used for uh, additional cubicle space uh, to support their existing uh, employees. Uh, the footprint of this addition is located in uh, the area that is an existing uh, concrete patio, so it's a, a large concrete area with uh, some gravel surrounding it, um, and it butts right up against the existing sidewalk and parking area in the front here. So the footprint will be largely within a uh, impervious concrete and mostly impervious gravel area. Uh, and then off over here to the right is a second floor or a deck off the second floor, which will cover um, the expanded patio area. Uh, there will be uh, a relocation of there's a retaining wall currently here along the uh, parking lot uh, as the, the patio is sort of sunken down in uh, below the parking lot. So we'll be relocating that retaining wall out to the rear of the sidewalk uh, to allow for, for uh, egress from the addition. Uh, if you go to the next sheet, please. So for stormwater, we will be uh, connecting the roof drains for this new addition and deck um, into a uh, closed drainage system. We'll be running it through a jellyfish filtration unit uh, and then connecting it into the existing stormwater system on site. Um, due to the, the fact that the area is mostly impervious or gravel now, we don't uh, have any uh, peak increases of stormwater from this project. Uh, if you go to the next sheet, please. And then uh, there's some additional utility work involved with this. There's an existing grease trap that's located in the existing patio. So we will need to relocate that further away from the building, which is shown here, um, to accommodate the addition. Uh, that existing grease trap actually outlets back under the building out to Goose Bay Drive. So because we're moving it further away from the building, we're going to need to be connecting that out into the sewer that runs down the shoulder of International Drive as opposed to reconnecting it to its existing outlet. Um, so that is the, the project, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for the applicant? Yes. I just have a question of interest. Um, so you need this cafe expansion plus first floor office and second floor office. Um, of 4,200 square feet to support your existing workforce. So, I mean, how much has your workforce increased? Uh, so basically, the, there's not enough space in the building for the current employees. Um, they have, Wanza has a number of satellite offices at, at uh, Pease as well. So just from the, the sheer number of people they have there, they don't have the, the space they need for everyone that they currently employ. So you mean like people come from off-site to have lunch there? Like from your other sites? Uh, the cafeteria is to, is to support the employees that work at this specific building, but it's just it's not adequate for the, the people that they have on, on site. It's, there's a lot crammed into this building, and they just need more space. So there hasn't been an increase in workforce? I'm sure there has since the cafeteria was originally built, but uh, it's nothing, you know, just an increase over time as, <clears throat> as the site's been built out over the years. Any other questions? I have one for the planning director. Is that now or later? Why don't you try now? <laughs> uh, I'm just a little confused um, about how Portsmouth Planning Board works with the PDA. So 
Tonight we'll be making a recommendation, correct? We won't be approving this. Is that how it works? So, and I did provide some background information in your memo about, so there's two things that govern this. The first thing is, this is specifically called out in um, state law, and there's a provision that I provided to you talking about how um, land use review occurs um, within the Peace Development Authority. So that part is the first piece, but the second part is really the most important piece that they may elect to um, adopt their own land use regulations and then they may subject those to board review for the jurisdictions for which the projects fall in. In this particular case, this project falls in Portsmouth's jurisdiction and their land use um, code provides that the planning board may review and it is a final decision when the planning board reviews this, but if they choose to appeal the decision, they appeal to the Peace Development Authority Board and that's how it will go. So whatever is decided this evening, they w it'll be a bind these stipulations that you create will be binding and they'll observe those stipulations. If they choose to appeal that, they would appeal that to their own board. So this won't have to go before the PDA board? This will not unless they choose to appeal it. If I'm incorrect about that, that's my understanding. Mike Bates from the PDA. <laughs> good afternoon or good evening everyone. <clears throat> My name is Michael Mates. I'm an engineering uh, project manager with the Peace Development Authority. And um, the, uh, the way that it's, this works is you guys make a recommendation to our board. And unless it gets appealed, like Beverly said, it's, it's, it stands. Um, if you have any specific questions about the process, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, but there's some parts of the PDA where we don't have authority, like millionaire didn't come before us. So in your, in your memo, I identified the districts that are subject to review. This does fall within um, the, uh, the airport business commercial district and as part of their uh, land use code, they identify which, area, which um, districts do fall within uh, this jurisdiction and which districts do not and that is uh, part of your memo. I can list those off if you'd like. If I may, um, whenever there's a, 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 prop, uh, a project in the business commercial zone or the industrial zone on the trade port that's in the city of Portsmouth, we refer everything over to you guys for your expertise and your participation. If it's in the airport industrial zone or it's in the airport zone, then we act as our own planning board um, because the airport is such a, a unique piece of property. And then just like we come to, come to you guys when there's a prop, uh, project in Portsmouth, we go to Newington if there's a project in Newington, and we ask for their assistance in evaluating the project. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm all set. Thanks. Any other questions to the applicant? we open the public hearing. Anybody here wish to speak to for or against this application? Anybody on Zoom? Last call, public hearing is closed. What's the board's pleasure? Go ahead. Uh, I'm looking at anyone else. Anyone else want to make a motion today? Yeah. All right, I'll vote to recommend site plan review approval to the Peace Development Authority as presented. Second. You want to explain it? Any discussion? I, I, I I've seen a lot of development at Peace, so we've done this many times, and this is probably the smallest expansion that um, Lons has done over my decade of looking at it. <laughs> so it's pretty minimal. <laughs> yeah. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? You are approved. <clears throat> You're just really efficient, Beth. That's all. No, I don't. Somebody else should make a motion. Mm -hmm. Come on, guys. Step out. <laughs> we have another public hearing request of road to the west LLC as owner and applicant for property at 140 yes. West Road requesting amended site plan approval to improve and install stormwater infrastructure re relocated dumpsters install landscaping and increase parking from 102 spaces to 122 spaces where 119 are required <clears throat> property is located in assessors map 252 lot 2-13 and lies within the industrial district LU 22-99 who is here to speak to this application this evening. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I'm attorney John Boson. I represent the applicant, along with Alex Ross from Ross Engineering and Mark Giannini from McHenry Architecture. 
Our client, Alex Choquette, is also here with us tonight to help answer any questions you may have. The proposal before you is for the conversion of the former Blitz Trampoline Park at 140 West Road into a membership-only indoor recreational facility that will feature uh, golf simulators, race car simulators, pool tables, arcade games, there's axe throwing, there's a gym, there's a lounge, and there'll also be 3,000 square feet of office space. The applicant spent before the zoning board and received a variance to allow this indoor recreational use. And we've also been through TAC, so this is our final stop where we're seeking site plan approval for uh, this, uh, this use. My client is making a number of improvements to the site, both to the interior of the building and to the exterior of the building in terms of landscaping. Also going to be installing a stormwater system that will detain, infiltrate, and treat uh, runoff where none currently exists. So with that background, I would like to invite the architect, Mark Gianni, to the podium. Mark's going to walk us through the interior of the site. Then Alex Ross will walk you through some of the exterior improvements. Then the team is available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Mark Giannini from McHenry Architecture. Uh, as John noted, you know, he basically went through a lot of the program that uh, we're uh, planning on providing for the interior. As he mentioned, also, it's a, it's a reuse of an existing building that was Blitz. Uh, it has a, mostly a warehouse appearance. Uh, part of the program is infilling uh, and providing a second floor or a mezzanine. So the first floor is approximately 18,000 square feet, and we'll be infilling on the second floor. Uh, we'll be infilling on the second floor here about two-thirds of the building and providing another approximately uh, 13,000 square feet of infill. Um, the, the program and interior use, as uh, was mentioned, we have a number of golf simulators here on the first floor as well as uh, axe throwing. There's a kind of a multifunction space here that are going to be used for uh, some events. Uh, the applicant is involved with a number of nonprofits, um, and he's hoping that he can use this as a facility that nonprofits can have fundraisers and other events. Uh, to the right on the first floor, we're providing a kitchen that's going to help support, again, the, those spaces uh, as well as the bar and restaurant function that's happening here. And then on the second floor uh, are some of the similar functions. Uh, we're going to, again, have golf simulators here. And the, the golf simulators are more than just golf. They're actually any, any really sport thing, have balls, uh, baseball, lacrosse, soccer. They can be used for multiple things. Uh, we also have a lounge out in this space, some office spaces. There's a corporate office here. And then uh, at the moment, we've got an area that's proposed uh, office space that's leasable and will be built out in the future. Um, for the most part, we're not really making any changes to the exterior of the building. There's uh, two stair towers, one on the, on the left and one on the top of the page here, that are being added for egress for that second floor infill. Uh, and then there's a dozen or so windows that are being added to provide some natural light that doesn't exist at the moment. But in general, the exterior facade uh, is going to, for the most part, remain untouched. So with that, I will turn it over to Alex, who can talk more about uh, the site improvements. Alex, John, and Mark. Um, I'm Alex Ross. I prepared the site plans that have been submitted. Um, as discussed, this is a, a fully developed uh, two-acre site that um, was built out in the late 80s and is kind of in need of a lot of uh, site upgrades and improvements. Um, and, and the owner has um, really done a lot of, designed a lot of improvements for this site. Um, so if we could go to the existing conditions plan, um, on this site there's uh, a lot of pavement and not a lot of landscape and very little in the way of uh, stormwater drainage control. If we could go to the site plan. Um, one thing we wanted to do here was collect as much runoff as we could from the roof 
uh, run that into stormwater cisterns that could be used for uh, site irrigation. Um, and we've also uh, designed two uh, jellyfish systems to filter stormwater runoff and redesigned a stormwater detention pond out back. It, there's actually no wetlands on this site, but further to the north, um, all this, this site drainage goes into a large wetland area. Um, if we could skip to the landscape plan. Um, <clears throat> so we had, we had a lot of positive um, feedback from TAC. We've added lots of landscape uh, along West Road, along the eastern sideline, as well as out back and in the uh, parking landscaped islands. Um, we, we have performed seven test pits on site to verify that the soil conditions were adequate for the proposed drainage design. Um, we did prepare a drainage design and a traffic study that was submitted uh, to DPW. And uh, in your staff memo, the planning department did recommend that this project be approved with a list of conditions. I'd be happy to, to run through those conditions uh, if the board would like. Uh, they're, they're all minor and um, we, are you we, in agreement with those conditions? We are in agreement with all those conditions. Then you don't need to read them. Okay. Yeah. So that, that pretty much covers it. it it's, it's just a, a huge improvement as, as far as uh, site work to, to a site that is kind of in need of it. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Any questions of the applicant team? Yes, Jane. Um, yes, I just wanted to ask how many parking spaces you're going to end up with. Yeah, so if we could go to the parking plan. Um, so in our plan set, we have a parking plan that lists all the spaces, and we come up with 119. <laughs> parking spaces and is that what you expect at your your peak capacity is anywhere between 119 and 119 times two people in a car it, are you can the building hold that kind of capacity so I'll, I'll let Mark handle that um, the the building can hold you know per code which is what we we're designing egress for you know so over 500 people um, and you know, per the zoning we've gone through, and, and part of your packet, there should be a, the calculations that we provided for um, to meet the zoning requirements for parking. So we basically came up with um, using a shared the shared mythology of the assembly use, which is the majority of the building, and the small portion that's office, mm -hmm. and came up with 119 as part of the calculation. So we're providing 119 spaces. And um, I see the extensive traffic analysis that you have there. It, it looks like the peak for in your traffic analysis is 104 cars going in and out. Um, can, can you tell me how that, whatever the peak is for your traffic analysis, lines up with your actual operating hours? Because this is not an 8 to 5 business, is it? Can't speak to the traffic analysis. Alex can, um, but you know it's not an eight to five business. It's probably more uh, late morning to you know, you know evening, evening late night time. But. And uh, just to add more information on, on the traffic study, um, we did work closely with uh, Eric Eby. Um, and he actually wanted a couple of different scenarios of, of how the traffic would flow. Um, so we did a couple of different uh, studies and submitted that all to Eric, and uh, he was happy with that. The, the end result is there's, there's really no impact. 
Any other questions? No other questions. I'm going to open the public hearing. A doubtful possibility. Does anybody wish to speak to for or against this application? Anybody on Zoom? No hands being raised. I'm going to close the public hearing. Board discussion. I make a motion that we vote to grant site plan review approval with the following stipulations 1.1 through 1.11. I second. Any discussion? <clears throat> I'll, if nobody else wants to talk, I always want to talk. Um, I really, you know, I, I love the idea of this in this specific place because a lot of the businesses in that area are really daytime businesses. So their peak is earlier in the morning and probably earlier in the evening than the peak is going to be. So traffic will really probably be a symbiotic with each other. Um, I also love all of the improvements, drainage and landscaping that they're doing to this area. It's really going to sort of take a site that's actually visible from Route 1 and make it, uh, in my opinion, a lot more pleasing to the eye than what exists there now. So I think overall it goes in the right direction of good. Any other comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? You are approved. Thank you. We have another public hearing. Request of Christopher H. Garrett, revocable trust to 2007 as owner and applicant for property at 1299 Islington Street. Requesting preliminary and final subdivision approval to subdivide one existing lot with 27,366 square feet or 628,000 acres of area and 199,300 feet of street frontage into two lots as follows. Lot one with 15,000 square feet or 344,000 acres of lot area and 100 feet of street frontage and proposed lot two with 12,366 square feet or 284,000 acres of lot area and 99 and 3,300 feet of street frontage. This property is on assessor's map 233 lot 119 is in the single residence B district LU 22-33. Who is here to speak to this application? Hello again. Uh, for the record, I'm Alex Ross. I prepared the plans for this site. Uh, I'm here with the owner, Chris Garrett, as well as Jenna and Ryan, who would like to build a house um, on this lot. Um, if we could uh, go to the site photos that were included in the packet. So this is the, the first site photo, um, which is just an aerial. Um, so this site is uh, on the right-hand side as you're headed out of town on Islington Street. Um, there's probably a couple of familiar landmarks there. Um, there is an old, old barn on the site, and we're almost across the street from Essex Avenue. Um, the, the owner has lived um, there with their family for many generations, uh, I think over 100 years actually, and um, it's such a large parcel, they'd like to um, make this subdivision. Uh, we did go to ZBA. Uh, there was su support from all the direct abutters for this project. Um, and we did receive the necessary variances. Um, we, we did have uh, two positive uh, TAC meetings to go through the project. So if we could go to the uh, plan set. And um, this is the subdivision plan. So you can see on this plan, um, on the right hand side of the parcel is the existing house and existing barn. And then on the left or western portion is the vacant land, which would be subdivided 
into a building lot. Um, if we can flip to the next sheet, the site plan. So on this uh, site plan, we showed one possible house layout configuration, driveway um, uh, layout to work, work through with uh, TAC. Uh, we positioned the, the driveway at the peak of Islington Street, so it provides good sight distance at the location. Um, and then the, the driveway leads to the house and then behind the house would be uh, the septic system, the leach field. So at this location in Islington Street, the city sewer actually stops over around Essex Ave, um, and it's common. Uh, many of the, the parcels down here have their own uh, leach field or on-site septic system. Um, and again, in your uh, staff memo, um, the planning board did recommend approval with a list of conditions that I'd be happy to go through. Um, they're all minor, um, and we accept all of them. And you don't need to read them again. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Any questions for the applicant? Yes, Jane. Could you just show me where the 12 inch tree that you think needs to be possibly removed due to site? Sure. Um, so that would be, and I don't know if we can zoom in right there, but there, there's a tree just to the right of where we're proposing the driveway. And, and that was discussed at TAC to make sure that um, we had a good, clear sight line there. If you remove the tree, could you plant another one? So there's actually um, a very large tree that is shown on the plant set as well. So almost where the, the new sideline will be, there's a 45 inch tree. So that will remain. It's this uh, small tree that is actually in the right of way that would be removed. And, and that shows up on the site plan. Okay, thank you. Yes, Jim. Uh, Mr. Ross, uh, I noticed uh, as far as the two lots being created, one's the existing and then there'll be a new, a new lot to the west. The existing home is on sewer. I see a sewer line extending out um, some distance. It doesn't really show where it ties in, but does, does it make any sense to have the new lot also tie in with an easement or something? Or why would they prefer a septic when they have sewer so close by? Yeah, so we did we did have some meetings with DPW and uh, a lot of discussions with that, and we, we actually scoped the existing sewer line. Um, so what happens is the city line stops somewhere back in here, um, and then there's just a line up to this existing house. Um, this this line here is old, um, portions of an old clay line. So um, DPW has stated if this house were to be tied into the city line, they'd want a new manhole, uh, a new trench in the right of way, a new PVC line, and possibly a new manhole down here. So it's several hundred feet, uh, a pretty expensive endeavor for just one house. Okay. Um, we, we have done uh, four test pits on the uh, new parcel. It has very good soil and, and could support a septic. So. so essentially it became cost prohibitive and not worth the expense. Correct. 
Any other questions? Thank you. Open a public hearing. Anybody here wish to speak to for or against this application? Anybody on Zoom? Public hearing is closed. Pleasure of the board. Anybody else want to make a motion? Oh, dear Lord. Vote to, I'll make a motion that we vote to grant preliminary and final subdivision with the following stipulations, 1.1 through 1.10. Any discussion? Yes, Jane. I just have a comment that is really refreshing to see a single house going in to a single resident zoned area. Hallelujah. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? You are approved. Thank you very much. That's a really good observation. It's mostly because single family homes don't typically have to come before us. It's the subdivision that came before us. It's true. <laughs> so. It's true, but I still like it. Just thought I'd make that point. We have a discussion about the capital improvement plan. Um, I will announce, and it has n it's purely coincidental that two of the members who will be on the planning board portion of the capital improvements aren't here tonight. Mr. Mahanan, Mr. Clark, and myself will be doing it. Well, you would need to take that action this evening to appoint them. So, so uh, Stephanie, can you pull up the presentation? We have a short presentation this evening. It is for the uh, benefit of the um, community and also the planning board. And Steph, if you don't mind pulling that up, I'll walk through that and try and be quick about it because I know it's late. So, so uh, good, good evening. It's good late evening uh, tonight's uh, presentation officially kicks off this year's CIP plan development um, tonight I'm going to uh, cover what the capital improvement plan is or the CIP um, what it isn't and, and talk about that too. provide an overview of the process and timeline and discuss public input opportunities uh, go ahead Seth. Uh, the CIP is a six-year plan for prioritizing and planning for major capital projects such as roadway paving and building improvements. It is a planning document alone. It does not commit any funding. And it works as a tool to help in budget development. And for the public, it provides three very important things. It provides an informational tool to understand the city's long-term budget strategy to and how they're going to essentially pay for large projects. It's an opportunity to actually recommend and suggest projects. And thirdly, it's an opp opportunity to comment on projects that are before uh, the planning board and city council as both, um, board, as both um, bodies do hold public hearings. Thank you. Next. So why do we do the CIP process? And the main reason is, is it's a very, it's good planning helps us to prepare for long range, uh, uh, long range budget, budget impacts for um, large capital projects. It allows us to anticipate those costs and spread them out over years if needed. And it also um, helps us to plan in advance and let the public understand what's coming. But it's equally important, it is required under state law that we develop a capital improvement program under RSA 674.5. This should be developed to include major projects cur uh, currently underway, and it should also be developed to help us prepare for future projects to be undertaken. Uh, most important, uh, the state notes, is that the sole purpose and the intent of the CIP is to help the mayor and council in their annual budget development. Uh, in accordance with state law, the city has adopted process language into the charter which provides that the manager shall prepare and submit to the council a six-year capital program at least three months prior to the final date for the submission of the budget. So this gives us a pretty early timeline in the budget process, and this is why we are kicking this off now. Uh, the, the CIP plan should include a general summary of the contents, a list of all capital improvements proposed during the next six years, cost estimates, methods of financing, recommended time schedules for each improvement, and estimated annual operating and budget maintenance costs. What, 
This is a really important slide. Um, often we get lots of applications that do not meet the threshold for what a capital improvement project is, so we thought it would be important to include a little bit of information about what qualifies. Generally speaking, it is land acquisition, construction or expansion of public facility, street utility or infrastructure, rehabilitation of public facility or capital, I mean, or public infrastructure, provided the cost is more than $50,000 design work or studies related to capital projects or implementation of the master plan, any item or piece of equipment, non-vehicular in nature that costs more than $50,000 and have a, has a life expectancy of more than five years, replacement and purchase of vehicles which have a life expectancy of more than five years or costs more than $50,000. What are the plan inputs? How do we arrive at the list of projects that ultimately get adopted into the CIP? There's three main uh, avenues to, for projects to be in the CIP. The first is taking a look at the adopted plan from the prior year. In this case, it'd be fiscal year 23 to through 28. We look at the projects that were adopted. Um, those are moved forward. Uh, and updated to represent any budget changes related to those plans or changes in feasibility. Some plans occasionally drop off, other times that they are adjusted as, as the funding might be, we might have a better understanding or the funding might have, requirements might have changed. Citizens can suggest projects, and we'll talk a little bit more about that at the very end of the presentation, because we definitely want to make the public aware of how to do that. And then, and then finally, staff can submit new projects that aligned with the aforementioned criteria and guidelines that I provided. Um, we would like to just, I just want to, I'll, and I'll iterate this a couple times, we'd like to receive all those submittals before September 30th to ensure um, their inclusion and consideration uh, as part of the CIP program as we like to get all those together and go through them and uh, we'd like to see those before uh, the end of September. So how are projects evaluated and prioritized? I think it probably is not surprising that we receive probably a lot more projects than we have funding for, and we have a lot more project ideas generated from staff than we have funding for. So we um, really we take a look at the, these criteria that are before you um, right now, and this is really the first place that staff begins as we start to evaluate and work with the city manager's office, and then ultimately the planning advisory committee, which will help refine those recommendations. But we take a look at whether they respond to a federal or state requirement. Do they address public health and safety need? Do they alleviate substandard conditions or deficiencies? Are they eligible for matching funds that have a limited time frame to, for implementation and we need to respond quickly or lose that opportunity? Their timing or location coordinate with another um, synergistic project or project close by. <laughs> if we're doing one project, it makes sense and we get some uh, cost economy by doing them simultaneously, then we would, uh, we would prioritize that. Um, have they been identified in a planning document or study? They improve quality of or provide added capacity to existing services, reduce long-term operating costs, provide incentives to economic development, or respond to citywide goal or submitted resident request. It's important to note that although these factors are utilized consistently in evaluating project submittals, um, that we also take into account or um, the public health and safety that might uh, might cause a, pro a project to leap to the front, something new that we're, weren't aware of and we need to address. Um, we would take a look at emerging community needs that have been articulated through the, to the, um, to, um, to staff and council and elected and appointed officials. We'd take a look at those. We'd also take a look at council priorities that have emerged. Um, this allows the process to um, have some predictability by consistently applying those standards, but also allows it to be nimble and responsive to conditions that change. All projects are evaluated for funding uh, to determine what funding sources uh, could be potentially utilized um, and then how, once we understand how they'll be paid for, how that will ultimately impact the budget, um, and what resources are, are available, and um, the impacts to both short-term and long-term budgets. And staff, as I mentioned before, will work with the city manager and the planning board advisory committee to prioritize projects based on the aforementioned criteria but also with a couple of general guidelines, some um, funding impact uh, 
a general rule we use for capital outlay, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, is to cap that at something not greater than 2%, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means of the annual budget. And then debt service for projects that are financed is, is typically capped at less than 10%. Um, we fall uh, well under the state requirements with that 10%. I could tell, I am told just today by finance that our capital outlay actually falls at 1%. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, it's, uh, the CIP is a planning document, I think, and I, I, I don't want to um, overemphasize that point, but I want to also help the community understand that it's an important planning document, it's a required planning document, but it does not provide any financial commitment. Uh, the project is proposed, there's not a financial commitment. Even if the project makes the plan, it's reviewed and adopted by the planning board, still we have no financial commitment. As we move through the review and adoption by city council, um, and propose it for the annual budget, still we have no financial commitment. It is with the budget adoption that we start to see a limited financial commitment, and I'll talk what that means. So let's take a look at what happens to projects when they make it into that budget. As I mentioned before, this slide illustrates how project funding is accounted for in the budget. Um, capital outlay, which is uh, essentially a way that projects can be funded, the best way to describe that is pay-as-you-go funding. Um, city goal is to allocate not more than 2%, we're at 1%, we're very conservative in that. And it's appropriated immediately upon the start of the next fiscal year, that, out, that, cap, that capital outlay will be available. Um, projects can also be funded through bonding or financing or borrowing. Um, unlike capital outlay, there is a step two to that. So even though a project may have made it into the annual budget, um, if it is identified for bond issuance or for borrowing, there's a second process, which means that, um, that we would have to have a separate public hearing and a vote by city council for that project to move forward as a funded project. And this is, uh, so there's two parts to that. So projects that are identified for that would are still have to go through another threshold, another public hearing. Uh, I just want to just to reiterate that I, I mentioned this at the beginning. There's uh, there's opportunities for public input through project submission. Uh, we would want to you know we have we've simplified the form this year to make that easier than ever and provided three ways to do that. Um, we will have a public hearing with the planning board uh, once the advisory committee has um, has uh, finalized that or refined that. We will have a public hearing with the planning board and the planning board will make a recommendation to council for adoption. Council in turn will have a public hearing, and then there will be a public hearing that's part of the city council budget that uh, towards closer towards the end of the fiscal year. Right. We are at the beginning, the kickoff. We started it early because we are trying to uh, make sure that we hit those milestones. Uh, we have the pro uh, um, project kickoff today, and we are inviting applications uh, today to start to come to. Uh, applications that have been submitted before today will still be included um, uh, because we really do take those most of the year and we put them in a file and say, well, we'll bring this up later. And But we are certainly um, asking the public at this point if they have been holding any reserve, this is the time. We'd like to see those uh, completed by September 30th. In October, we, as I mentioned, we'll start to review those. We'll also work on the city's uh, staff submittals and the CIP financials are prepared and the documents are um, assembled to, uh, to move that pr the entire CIP forward. Um, planning board will review in November and December um, the, uh, the recommendations of the advisory committee and the staff um, hold a public hearing and recommend adoption um, based on whatever refinements they provide and send it forward to council who in turn hold their public hearing, adopt, and move it forward to be considered as part of the budget. I don't want to miss the chance to talk just briefly about the three ways that um, the citizens might submit projects of interest. You can go to City of Portsmouth or Plan Portsmouth and there's a, a link on that and this presentation has also been posted. Um, and in that, at that link you will go to a landing page which provides a, a fillable a uh, form we've simplified that year and got rid of some of the planneries speak so that it's really clear just a project description. We've also um, provide there's a link for citizen requests that will take you to viewpoint. 
I think for a lot of folks, viewpoint is an extra step that they probably don't want to do, but we did get quite a few last year through that, through that online portal, and so that is another option available. Or you can go to the planning department where we have hard copies available, and you can fill out a form and submit it that way. And so these are the three ways uh, we put in there. The deadline is September 30th. We'd like to uh, uh, invite those um, those starting today. So I'd be glad to answer any questions for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beverly. That was really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of notification or how, do, how does the public get to know? It's, it's a really other than from this meeting and and knowing that it's there. It's going to be a lot question. of people that don't and might not see the meeting. It's a very good question, and we recognize that folks don't often sit and watch meetings. So we are going to be working with our uh, with uh, Stephanie Secord, who uh, helps with our communications, to utilize social media and try and identify as many ways as we can to you know get that information out there. City Council will have this presentation Monday. Um, and we are going to, uh, we actually had talked about, we have a separate page, but we will try and use whatever that we have at our disposal to try and get the word out with the links and the uh, information. We, we, I think this council is really dedicated towards um, public awareness and transparency will work and has really given us a directive to be more broadly disseminate that. And so we'll, we're working to accommodate that request. And Beverly, uh, is there any minimum, um, you know, amount for a project that a resident would propose? So I think the general uh, guideline for that is $50,000. It's the $50,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And do they have to work out their own budget? We have not asked that they do that. We, you know, we would take a look at it. I mean, I think a lot of them come in and are directed to, uh, I think, um, uh, traffic and safety, mm -hmm. uh, but definitely we would take a look at that and try and identify. And then I think what we have in the CIP is really a really comprehensive list of all the requests that come in and how the staff responded to each one. We try and keep a good record of that and so that folks can check in and see how the project was essentially evaluated, directed to another process, and we will try and inform folks about that as we go along. Thank you very much. Can I just make one comment? I, I really quickly, just for anyone that might still be listening to us at this hour, <laughs> I always have used, in my neighborhood, I'd used the CIP project in putting in citizen requests as we wanted sidewalks, and we had been asking and asking. So every year we would submit it because, you know, when everyone really wants something, then it's more, it's more, it's more possibility that it might get moved up and people are paying attention. So, uh, so in some cases, a lot of those requests are things that are already in the books. But I'll say it again on Monday, I promise. Before everybody leaves, Franco did have an announcement for us. Yeah, I want to thank you guys all for uh, having me here, but tonight's going to be my last meeting. I am resigning my position on the board. Unfortunately, I just can't, I don't have the ability to make the time commitment to be here for meetings and everything, so. Thanks for your service. Thank you. Thank you for thank the time you, for your you spent. <clears throat> yes, thank you. And with that, we are adjourned.